Welcome. Today is January 12th, 2024, and this is Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. Uh, and really, really happy to be here today with two members of Four in the Chamber. Uh, really, really awesome, hardcore band from the Bronx. Uh, and why don't you all go ahead and introduce yourself, say a sentence or two about yourself, and then we'll get into your family history. Sure. Here. Absolutely, Steve. Uh, great to be here. Dave Mitchell. I'm going to start band history as far as the first band from the Bronx I was in with uh, Violent Carnage was my first band. Uh, then I was in Without a Cause. Then it was Four in the Chamber. Then it was uh, Unstable Foundation, Apparition, and my current band, Extinguish the Code, from the Bronx. Awesome. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for being here. Hi, my name is Frank Gagliadotto. Um I've always been in Four in the Chamber and Unsta Unstable Foundation. Excuse me. Great. And, and um, Frank, what, what instrument in front of the chamber? I play guitar. Guitar. I'm sorry, yeah. Steve. I play bass. And he was also in a band called Nightfall. Yeah, I don't bring that up. <laughs> uh -huh. maybe, 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 maybe we'll we'll revisit that in a second. <laughs> this is honesty time, Frank. I, I started. Do you want me to say it again for editing purposes? No, 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 no. This is well, real, man. Yeah. Um, so we'll get a lot more into um, music history in, in a second. But why don't both of you say a little bit about your family history and background? Whatever you might know about it, how your family ended up in the Bronx, um, stuff along those lines. Absolutely. Uh, my parents lived by Woodlawn Cemetery originally. Uh, I believe they worked in Manhattan. They did a lot of traveling back and forth. And then they were the initial inhabitants of that lovely place that came after Freedom Land called Co-op City, where I grew up for 28 years with my parents. Uh, Diane and Albert Mitchell, and uh, I was born in Mount Sinai Hospital. I think that's really all as far as, and then uh, I wound up getting married to my first wife. I lived in Pelham Bay after moving out of Co-op City, and then after my first divorce, I wound up living in Country Club okay. with my second girlfriend. So I spent at least 31 years in the Bronx. And all kind of like in the East Bronx. Absolutely. Corridor area, well, right? well, we'll go into some of the other Bronx later when we start discussing musical history. But most of it was, yeah, there. Because then um, my last wife, I spent a good eight years living in Marion Avenue next to Fordham Road in the Bronx as well. Okay, okay. okay. So I've, I've seen the Bronx. All right, we'll get more into that. So and wait, hold on. Oh, so yeah, sure, by sure. the way, so anybody in Chicago or Jersey that thinks... Our pizza is the best, just to reaffirm that. I concur. Um, so it's a long history. I know my. I actually know my family history. Um, That's great. My father's father came over from Sicily, uh, Palazzi Generosa, in uh, I think 1901 or 1904. Um, went to Ellis Island like everyone else. Uh, checked in. Um, he lived in Manhattan on Prince Street with his family. He had multiple brothers and sisters. I can't tell you how many. You know, Italians, they used to breed a lot back yeah, then. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, he met my grandmother and moved to the Bronx in the 40s, I believe. And uh, then dad was born. Um, my mom was born in Astoria, but was adopted when she was three in like 19... Not, I'm sorry, not three, when she was 13 months old. Oh, wow. And... Uh, by a couple that lived in the Bronx, which were my grandparents, I will say, because even though they adopted to me, they're my grandparents. Sure. And uh, they met each other in the Bronx. There, there used to be a pool somewhere in, uh, I think it was Castle Hill or um, or Bronx Bronx River or somewhere over there. They met each other and uh, you know got married, had some kids. I was born in uh, the Rosedale section of the Bronx on uh, Noble Avenue. Sure. I think that's Rosedale. They changed it so much and. Uh, I moved over to Pelham Bay when I was five, attended PS71, um, IS192, which I don't think is there anymore. Yeah, I don't think it is. And Lehman High School. Um, after living in Pelham Bay, I moved to Country Club, which is basically the same neighborhood, yeah, and sure. uh, lived in Country Club until 2009. Wow. To 2010, excuse me, where then I moved to Yonkers and then on to where I live now in, in Dutchess County. Sure. So why don't both of you say a little bit about um, your experience in, in schools in the Bronx? Sure. I have no problem with that. So my l <laughs> earliest was uh, in Co-op City. I went to Goose Bay Nursery School. That I remember. 
then it was PS160, then after PS160 it was IS180, which is right next to Truman High School. Sure. So I went, um, and after that, when we were, you know, high school was the big jump for everybody. Um, I spent two years at Music and Art High School in Manhattan. Oh, okay. As an art major, uh, my mother was a very talented artist. Uh, I, not so much. I, but I got into the school, which you had to take a test for. But I really wasn't, wasn't meshing at that point. And all my friends went to Lehman High School. So all my friends were in Lehman High School at that point. I really didn't. I wasn't getting along in LaGuardia. I just felt like an outcast. So I arranged a transfer to Lehman High School where I got a, basically my fell in love with music basically started in Lehman High School. After that, I went to Westchester Community College, like most of us do after that point. Um, I have a culinary degree from Institute of Culinary Education in Manhattan. And that was my school trip, man, but... Lehman High School was where it started. Yeah. Lehman High School was the crux of uh, everything musically. And, you know, probably half of those bands wouldn't have existed if I didn't go to Lehman High School. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll, we'll get more into that in a second, too. You went to Lehman, too, right? I did. I did. Um, but but talk, talk a little bit about uh, the elementary and, and uh, junior high experience uh, um, for Lehman for you. Sure. I mean, it... it was like you know the typical school you see on TV where everybody goes in and and like there's it wasn't it, it like was Bayside clicky, High. It wasn't, what are you talking about, was, man? You know, everybody kind of just did their own thing. Like yeah. uh, it wasn't like you know there was this group and that group, especially in like elementary. It did the group started getting more high school, but yeah, sure. um, as far as like um, the learning and stuff, I learned everything I pretty much know from the New York City public schools and. You know, people might say the school system's not good, but I don't agree unless it's changed in the last, like, you know, 40 years or whatever. Because there, there's people I know that are the same age as me that don't have half the education before college. And I'm, I'm not a college graduate. And yeah. I, I feel sometimes I know more than some people that are on the same education level as me because I went through the New York City public schools and took advantage of all the programs they had. Sure. We were using computers before people even knew where computers were in some places. Wow. Like, uh, you know, uh, it, it was once a week, a computer lab. Um, you know, they had good programs and uh, I, I feel that it, it definitely uh, made my life a lot better than, than it could have been if I was if I was raised somewhere else. Were there music in our programs in, in the public schools for you all? High school for me. Oh, well, junior high, too. I played trumpet. High. I had high school. I was in guitar class. Miss <laughs> Ingerman's. Oh, wow. uh, oh, yeah, I was in her class as well. Yeah. Miss oh, Ingerman's wow. guitar, whatever it was. That's where I actually, well, when you get to that, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Miss Ingerman's class was the only class I ever got 100 in on my uh, report card. I, I scored very, <laughs> very well in a lot of uh, our bands, generate the original, like, our high school thrash bands generated from that classroom because wow. that's where like-minded individuals started discussing and meeting each other. And, and, you know. and that was the thing, like back in the eighties and nineties, there wasn't a lot of people that listened to metal and hardcore. Yeah, sure. So like when you ran into somebody that listened to the same music as you, you kind of gravitated towards each other because it's like, Oh wait, we could be friends. Even though I'm friendly with that guy, like, yeah, we like the Yankees. That's yeah. how we're friends. But when I talk, metal with him he, he doesn't care yeah, sure. but then you have these other friends that listen to the same music and then all of a sudden you start meeting more people and more people and then you know there's a handful of people but it, it, it was almost it's like, like a, an it was, unrecognized group i was just gonna say that it was a very underground community in lehman in those days because it was weird because you had frank was part of one group and i'm gonna go into that and you had your group that all wore their motorcycle jackets uh -huh. their jean jackets their nuclear assault, you know, Killers. their big patches on their jackets or their flight jackets and Doc Martens. Then you had the other group that was dressed like your typical Guidos, but they were all, there was about six or seven of them, but they were all closet hardcore metalheads. Huh. Those are my friends. And, exactly. <laughs> wow, okay. and they dressed that way because they wanted to pick up the girls. <laughs> it, it worked. So yeah. it was, and actually, they actually listened to more extreme thrash than the metalheads did. Wow. And it was very, um, my, oh, since we're going to go into yeah, yeah, music yeah, anyway, my original guitar player, Pat Lambert GC, was 
Frank's probably mentor and taught Frank how to play guitar, but that guy listened to like destruction and overkill. If you saw him walking down the street, you never know it. No idea. You think there's a straight Ginzaloon kid that <laughs> drives an I Rock and stuff like that, but we, we would sit in his room and listen to like you know metal records all the time, well CDs at the time, but uh, or tapes, tapes whatever came out. Tapes, and yeah, for sure. Same at my house. We would just listen to music all the time, and you know uh, it, it was good memories growing up. Um, it was, Did both of y'all start getting into heavier music only in high school or before high school? I, I was in junior high when I started. Okay. Started. Yeah, talk so, about that. How'd you get into it? So, um, so I lived, we just moved to a new apartment in, in Pelham Bay, down the street from Lehman Edwards Avenue. And uh, my neighbor, who was like a year younger than me, he listened to like Metallica and believe it or not, Guns N' Roses. Okay. Like, uh, so he it's would, we, would we became friends right away. And like, he's playing this stuff and I'm like, wow, this stuff is pretty cool. Like, so, you know, uh, I don't, please don't sue us, Metallica. I made a copy of Injustice for All. <laughs> and, uh, I, you I say made a copy of his Injustice for All uh, tape, <laughs> and I started rocking that, and his Master Puppets, and I was like, wow, this stuff is amazing. I started listening to Metallica, then I went into Megadeth, Anthrax, then I remember in, in uh, um, late 80s, I believe, I was watching MTV, and Sick of It All's video for Injustice System came on. Oh, and I was like, who is this band and where can I find their record? And yeah. like, I started listening to Sick of It All. And, you know, then it started opening my mind to more hardcore. I, I, I discovered all the bad brains and, um, you know, and just moved on with the scene. I didn't go as to many shows as Dave did because uh, I'm a year and a half younger. And at the time, like, I was like 14 and my parents, like, you know, they weren't strict, but you're not going to the city to a show like to them with a bunch of crazy people like yeah, beating each yeah, other yeah. up. So yeah. I didn't get that full experience that Dave did when he was a little bit young in that time frame. So, um, but yeah, that's how I got into it. And then I just started finding other bands. Then I would hear from people that this band's great. I would check them out. Sometimes I, I would buy a, a CD or tape and I would love it. And then there's times I bought it and I was like, eh, yeah. not really my thing. Like, yeah. uh, you know, Dave, so, about you? Oh, so, when I started in music and art, uh, I'm not going to lie, it started with like guns, it all starts with Guns and Roses and that, in that people, age, yeah. and then I started to make some friends there, and it, then it became Slayer, and then it became Megadeth, and then it was just a whole uh, rig of mortis and Exodus and bands like that. I remember my first heavy concert that I went to was the first Headbangers Bowl tour uh, okay. with Anthrax, Anthrax Halloween and Exodus opened and it was the scariest most fun experience well I'll get to the first scariest one but that that was taking the, the, the express bus down into Manhattan going by yourself going to the concert and I was like wow this is great and then it evolved more you start to explore more Headbangers Bowl changes the game because, and like Frank said, in Justice System, I saw Anthem by Agnostic Front, and I was like, what is this? Where is this? So we had newspapers back then called The Aquarian and The East Coast Rocker, if everybody remembers those. So I saw there was a show at the Marquee in Manhattan. It was, and I didn't know any of these bands, and I didn't, there was... Like, it was just like one of my friends from Music and Art was like, oh, you should go check it out. It was uh, Killing Time headline, okay. Sheer Terror, Jeez. and The Iceman, and a band called Eye for an Eye. Oh, okay, okay. From okay. back in the day. So I remember exactly to this day what I was wearing. I was wearing a black tight jeans. Not exactly what you want to go to those shows were back in the day. <laughs> like black Nikes or something. A nuclear assault with the green nuclear guy with the one thing backwards I had it Mutants backwards produced. and I had the first original biohazard shirt I figured hey I got a biohazard wow. shirt I'll fit in and it was the OG one and I walked in there and I got there late and Killing Time was doing a cover of We're Not Gonna Take It by Twisted Sister and my 18 year old eyes had never seen anything like what I was watching it was just kids mobbing the stage and I was just like oh, what it what is this and another memory from that show I remember Paul Bearer from Sheer Terror wearing a leather g-string <laughs> and I was like 
what is going on with this madness, but that's where my music taste started to take the more crossover into the hardcore realm, which when we discuss like Lehman and stuff, that's where it all started to bridge. Did, did you go into the pit in that show? I did not. I was <laughs> terrified. Yeah, and I bet. Well, I, well Dave was like 140 like pounds. Yeah, I was, wet very, when he was, I was yeah. very skinny, and it was just, again, you, like, I'm going to fast forward a little. Don't want to side, side swipe. But uh, my daughter, Kayla, when she was, it's weird, as she when she was younger, she was into Mad Ball, Wisdom and Chains, and H two O. Now yeah. she's fifteen, and she's into like Doom stuff and Typo Negative and Life of Agony. But nothing, whatever, nothing wrong with Typo. Whatever. <laughs> so all ages show in Manhattan. Myself, uh, my friend Massa, and my guitar player, other guitar player Gian, we're like, I'm gonna take Kayla to go see Wisdom and Chains and H two O. She's eight years old. It's all ages. I'll do it. I mean, she wanted to go. Yeah. And I remember her just sitting there during Wisdom and Chains set, and she saw a kid stage diving, and you want to see a kid? Kid looked like they saw Santa Claus. <laughs> it was just like this is the coolest thing ever, Dad. This is awesome. So I kind of felt cool because it was like passing the torch a little, but I didn't want to sidetrack too much. But. So, so at that show, would you say that show kind of like hooked you into the hardcore scene, or was it? Uh, I, 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 I was wait. I was hooked right then and there. Yeah. But again, it, it's still what what I did notice, which was one of the cool and awesome things was about hardcore and punk and even metal for a lot. Everybody looked different. Yeah. Every culture, race, everybody was represented. Everybody was dressed differently. And no one cared. And no one gave a shit. Yeah. It was just everybody was like, I felt like in high school when you dress like that, you know, hate to say it, the jocks would pick on you. They call you a dirty metalhead. Yeah, or, dirty metalhead or stuff like this or, you know, skinhead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at those shows, it was just like, it didn't matter what you looked like. It was just everybody hanging out, having a good time, just rocking out, getting their, their energy out on the dance floor or singing along. I was like, this is a safe place. Yeah. This is a place where people can be who they want to be and express themselves through music and make new friends. And, you know, it was just, again, you're taking the train, you don't, you're by yourself because this is how you go to explore stuff and you go to a new, this is before cell phones and you just got like directions on a piece of paper and you're going to the shows and it's just like, it's a whole new world and it gets open and man, kids today, you guys don't know how good you have it. What do we have? We had MySpace. Even no, back in the nineties, we had nothing. We had MouthSpace. Like you heard about things from other people. There was yeah. no if you if it wasn't on MTV, and most like hardcore bands weren't, um, because most hardcore labels couldn't afford to pay MTV to put to put videos on. Yeah, for sure. So you know that became the attitude. Like, yeah, you know, it's, screw MTV. I'm not going on there. It's that's, like, it, it, that's funny that he put up videos. Um, that's great. There was no YouTube, so like you. Learned about bands through tape trading, like yeah. uh, you know, oh, you got to check this band out; they're really good. You go listen to them, and then you make a copy of their tape. Unfortunately, you know, it t it steals money from artists in a way, but Steve, it's I the really, only way I, you got popular. I apologize; I copied over some Battle of the Bands footage with porn. Sorry, <laughs> either it was either me or my brother, but I really feel bad because you probably could have used it. It probably would have been amazing. It was really that's leaving right. high school I'm, battle I'm sure of the bands. A, I know that's a very common story. <laughs> it's bad, bro. And I had, I had, I had Requiem. I had my oh, old band Carnage. Yeah. I had his band Nightfall. I had all these bands on video, man. and now it's just bad. Softcore porn. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I dropped the ball. I didn't know this was going to happen. I know. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Did, so, was there ever a point where you started going with more people down in Manhattan that shows? All right. So, we might as well go go this route yeah, because yeah. this is this is where it's going to start. Uh, got transferred to Lehman High School. We were playing in. A, we were in the guitar class, or was it music theory or whatever? It was no, called. it was guitar. The guitar. Mm -hmm. And then you start meeting like minded people. You know, like, and then the 18 year old always gets the idea. Let's form a band. Uh -huh. So we found, I got a singer. We met everybody in the guitar class. Yeah. And it was funny because originally our friend Pat was not the original guitar player for Violent Carnage. It was some other kid, Chris. 
and I just, Pat was very quiet and always sat in the corner of the room. And I, I remember this verbatim to this day. I saw him in the corner and he was playing on the acoustic guitar, the intro to Hello to Gutter by Overkill. And this is like a 17, 18 year old guy. And I'm like, my jaw just dropped. Yeah, he, he had a, a knack for hearing something and just going uh, back he, and playing it. Like one of these guys, there, there's probably, in the span of playing guitar players that I've played with, Frank, phenomenal. My guitar player, Gian. Frank from Fahrenheit 451. Uh, Caesar from District 9 on a different... These guys I'm talking about on different levels. But, but we're, yeah. we're all different style guitar players, yeah. too. That's yeah, the, sure. the crazy thing. Like, we all listen to similar music because Frank from Fahrenheit and I would talk about music and, uh, like, he listened to a lot of the same stuff I do, but him, him and I, completely different style guitar Very players. Style, so, yeah. But this kid was in the corner just riffing out. I'm like, ooh, I have a great idea. Let's get three guitar players in the band. Yeah. That usually means someone has to go. Yeah, so <laughs> no. so Chris wound up quitting. We didn't throw him out, so yeah. whatever. And then, so Violent Carnage or Hokey, for, I'm going to send you black and white band photos. Oh, nice. Guys. Nice. Yeah, I don't look anything like it. So we started doing what all bands do. We started playing shows in the, Frank was roadieing for Pat, and... We were playing like Jersey Studio One. We were okay, playing we play. Februarys in Queens. We played Obsessions in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, we rented a bus to bring all our friends to shows. We were like, "This is the greatest thing ever!" And you know, little do you know, it's just like that sucked you in. Uh huh. And then we started, you know, starting to go to more shows. Like uh, we started going to the world stage, and I remember seeing Biohazard at the world stage with Creator. Oh, wow. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you want to talk about a ridiculously mixed crowd? Holy God. One of the, still to this day, best show, one of the best I've ever been to. I saw Pantera at the Ritz before they were opening for Suicidal Tendencies and Exodus. Wow. And I, all these years later, I laugh because I just, I was telling the story to my daughter. Phil comes on stage and he said, welcome to New York Hardcore. And at the time I was like, all right, great. This is what it is. Okay, wonderful. And now I'm looking back at all these years later. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, so not anything that it was. But yeah, like you said, you start. I saw Testament and Nuclear Assault at the Ritz. It was just those. Listen, once you're in a band, going to shows. You got people to travel with. Yeah, that's right. It, what, it, what about you, Frank? It becomes like a drug. Yeah. Like I, 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 you know, I hate to say it like that, but it is. But no, you it start to, you start to really start to enjoy like music, and then yeah. all you want is more, 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 more. So, when we were younger, like I mentioned, my parents were a little bit stricter, and I ran with a crowd that a that um, didn't really go to shows, and you know, uh, uh, I struggle with anxiety. Anxiety, so sometimes. I would I wouldn't go down to the city by myself because yeah. like I would get worried like something would happen to me like sure. um, it started to get better as I get older, but um, the first show I ever went to was commercial it was Metallica um, 1991 Black Album tour. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. A friend of my mom's that she worked with wanted to take me because I was this little cute kid to her and I, I, I it was amazing like uh, she didn't you know, know. I, I don't really enjoy Metallica's music now, but back sure. then I they, they were I loved them. Hey, who who played with them? Do you remember? Uh, the, the opening band. You know what? They had no opening band. Oh. They okay, okay, because okay. they played for like two and a half hours, and they had like a thirty minute video before they played. Oh. Uh, and, wow. and they had this like, it was the the um, the show when Lars had like a drum set and he ran across the stairway and then during the Four Horsemen break. And, oh, you know, that like, guy, huh? It's the the same concert on the live ship Binge and Purge stuff, but it was yeah, you yeah, know the yeah. one that was somewhere else. I, I went to the National Coliseum to see this. Um, then after that, I said, wow, shows are fun. So, uh, in like 92, <laughs> shows are fun. Pat Leroy GC, the person he's talking about, yeah. and I, we went to, um, to see Megadeth and Suicidal Tendencies at the Ritz, the old Ritz. And, uh, and then it just started to downward spiral as like, uh -huh. at, I shouldn't say downward spiral. Like it's an upward, upward spiral. spiral. Yeah, yeah, sure, um, sure. You know, then I started to see bands I really like, like uh, Life of Agony, Typo Negative I went to see. I love Typo Negative. Um, I know you don't understand it. You don't. Understand. Um, <laughs> My daughter is a huge Typo Negative fan. I blame him in, in 
Not really, but it's definitely his fault. And, and then as I started to get older, you get jobs, you have a little bit of money in your pocket. Yeah. Now you can pretty much go to any show you want. So like, you know, I, this band's playing at uh, at Roseland this weekend. You know, you could go see them. Like it's so like I mean I could start rattling off every band I've seen, but like like it, we'll be here all day. Yeah, like, yeah, sure. I sure. haven't been to as many shows as Dave, but every band he pretty much mentioned I've seen. Um, you know, um, I've seen like Slayer, Anthrax, um, Suicidal Tendencies, Megadeth, Testament, Overkill. Um, as far as hardcore, I've seen Sick of It All, one of my favorite bands. Yeah. I've seen them. I, I it looks like a 12 year old kid when he of times sees them. I've seen them. Uh, <laughs> and like these are the bands that made me keep. When I'd see them, I would say, I want to keep doing this. Yeah. I want to keep doing this. And, you know, it just it becomes a drug and you just want to stay part of it. Very expensive drug. Yes. Yeah. You make tons of friends in the, in the scene and. You start meeting people at shows, seeing faces at the same shows, and it just progresses after that. Now, before we get into both of you and your, you know, picking up musical instruments and all for the first time and all of that, let's talk about um, slam dancing in the pit. Did did both of y'all ever uh, Me, get too much when I was into younger. it? Yeah, yeah, he, he did. Yeah. And then, and then, like late twenties, early thirties, I had to have alcohol going. <laughs> and, and, I learned a very valuable lesson. These are important. And unfortunately, uh, I think, I'm trying to think. I had my nose broken. Like once, in, once in a while, it's like, I, I, I think in uh, Marty's and Lenny's in New Rochelle, I danced for Biohazard and Life of Agony. And it was, that was be kind of cool because the shows were empty. I knew them, which we'll go into from when Without a Cause was practicing in Brooklyn. Oh, so we yeah, sure. they practiced in the same spot. So I kind of felt like I was in my comfort zone. Yeah. So I felt like it was okay. But other than that, I was never... A, a, actually, I'm trying to think. I I, oh, our old singer John danced. Sometimes. He, Sometimes. He, I'm trying to think if there was ever he, he anyone... He like a rock in a hubcap, though. <laughs> <laughs> my, my current singer, Lugo, does dance. Okay. He does dance, and he's like a big, scary rhinoceros when he dances. <laughs> he's a big dude. So, I mean, other than that, listen, I, I think it's cool. As, as When you're on stage, that's what you want to see playing in this kind of music. Yeah, you yeah, want the yeah. dancing, and you want the sing-alongs, because I always feel like... If you got the sing-alongs and pylons, and Frank will probably 100% agree with me, that means your lyrics connected with somebody. Absolutely. And yeah, that's, that's a good feeling. That's cool as hell. And that's the reason why I guess, like I tell my, my new singer who's much younger now, I say, that means your lyrics connected with somebody. And that's important because that you're talking about a life experience and now you're connected with that person. So that's that's everything. Yeah. That's everything. Yeah. You'd so, agree, right? Yeah, yeah. So, a pit story I have. Um, back in like '92, maybe uh, I was about 16, 17 years old. I went to see Megadeth and Suicidal. I mentioned the show before at uh, at the Ritz, and like I got when Megadeth started playing, I was probably about 20 feet from the middle of the stage. I weaseled my way there. I was a really skinny kid. Yeah. And they opened up with Holy Wars. He was skinny. I got flung. I was smaller than everybody. I got flung around so much. Anxiety kicked in. I pushed myself like scared to death and went all the way to the back of the crowd and just watched them nice and safe from the back of the <laughs> of, uh, of, out of the pit. I was just like, you know what? That's a little too much for me. Like, uh, and but, honestly, uh, you like, uh, I got to be honest, when I was younger and we were doing this, I like to watch bands. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, I really, especially, and this isn't, and this is going to sound weird, it's just that you want to see how bands move and give a performance and and, and, and and you want to hear the notes and you want to oh wow all right that was cool what that drummer did there you know yeah, or yeah. this is a, a guitar riff that listen man and she's gonna probably hear this it's like when you get when somebody gives you the gift of like hey check this band out and then it's like wow like frank fahrenheit uh turned me on to burn Oh, Good yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. like, like, all right, and then I'm getting it more and more, and I'm getting the lyrics and the chords, and it's it's so different. 
and it stands out. And to this day, it's like, uh, bad brains are like that too. It's just like, eh, maybe I didn't get it that much when I was 18, 19. Yeah. Now, and I'm looking at it now, yeah. now I'm like, Oh my God. Like, this is like, so this is music. When some, somebody says, Hey, check something out. And it's, it could be a life changer for you. Like where you're going to go with your music career or as far as how you play. And your influences. Sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off. Oh, no, 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 no. That's fine. You're bringing up a lot of memories. That's, that's good. Why. That's good. That's the, that's the point of this. Yeah. That's the point of you, this. You know, it was, there was a time where uh, shows, and this may be like a small negative point, they started sometimes not to become fun to go to because if the band was big, everybody would pile on the stage. This used to happen at the Wetlands, remember? Everybody 800 would people pile on, on stage. the stage. And, like, flood the stage with people, and you couldn't see the band or enjoy the band. VOD. Um, VOD. Uh, it happened during No Redeeming a few times. Uh, uh, I remember one time Indecision played at the Wetlands. Yeah. And, like, it was just chaos. Tom just had to hold the mic out like that. And and it was just... It, it, nobody... If you weren't in the pit or piling on, you really couldn't enjoy the band. Yeah. i got to be honest. I beg to differ. I love that stuff. You know, <laughs> I, the I do. on tour... <laughs> You're, you're, you're misunderstanding. Somebody was all on the pile. To this, when no. they see Dave pile the fuck on the yeah, stage. You're, mis- <laughs> you're misunderstanding me. You're misunderstanding me. The pile-ons are cool when when you could still enjoy the band from a distance. Like yeah. When everyone's piling on and the mic's taken from the singer and like the sound is all muffled it, it, and you're just trying to watch uh, a show. It's I don't hard. know, man. I've seen a 25-year-old guy that might be sitting next to me during Earth Crisis do the that exact... That was different. That was but different. I, I never grabbed a microphone and said, ah. <laughs> no, you were piling on the top of it. All right, so I'm guilty of it, too. What just they saying? saying. Just you, saying. You either die the villain or live uh, you long die enough the hero to or, or live long enough to become the villain. Just saying, man. <laughs> I'm just saying. I saw you on plenty of Sick of it all, pile on. <laughs> you know, just delete. I this get part. what he's saying. I get what he's saying, but I'm, I, I think what he more more or less was trying to say, like I, I saw videos and stuff of like VOD on Long Island where it wasn't people singing along. It was just like nineteen hundred people on stage, and you couldn't. Yeah, yeah. See that, that's band. basically what I'm trying you to say. You couldn't see the band. Yeah, sure. That guy, and you can't hear the lyrics, and you can barely hear the band because everyone's standing in front of the stage and the amp. Which is that that that, that I've like, I, we I've seen it and. It long, remember uh, what was it? Uh, Doctor Shays. Those packed shows were just it, yeah. It, it was the 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 room was so. Bro, it was probably from there to here. Wow! And I remember, small, yeah. I remember the show was uh, four in the chamber. No redeem. This is not the order. No redeeming. Shut down in Fahrenheit, and there was no, no room in there, and it was just. It, it was I great. It was movie. awesome. I, I do too. I'll never forget yeah. those type of shows. Yeah. There's a lot of shows I'll just... Some I block out of my memory. Others I'll remember like when the brawl broke out at the Straight Edge show. CC's. During Earth Crisis. Which I was like, we're, we're, this is Straight Edge. I, I didn't show. even notice there was a fight. I was enjoying Earth Crisis. So <laughs> but there was like a massive like 40 kid brawl. And I'm like... Wow. We're at a like a, a, I thought this was the positive. Yeah, right. And this is just, <laughs> hey, just... You see a lot of things and you realize how silly... Like, you're fighting in a show where you're coming in, like... People kid. fighting at all is just... Like, I hate that stuff. Yeah. I just It just takes away... Like, I always... Again, the way I always see it... And I, I try to describe this to my singer all the time. I'm like, all right, if you're a young kid, cause we've all been there, and you're going to a show and that's what you see for the first time, are you going back there? Yeah. You're not going back. You're going to be one of those kids that sits at home and just YouTubes everything. Yep. Instead of being the kid that travels to go see their favorite bands because it's like it's a great experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Listen, once in a while, knuckleheads do happen. You know, like you have a. Uh, I, I remember when I was in Apparition, my, my singer always dated some sketchy individuals. And I was like, please don't bring that person. Just don't bring that person. Because, the, uh, you know, there's a scene or a community, there's certain rules to dancing. Yeah, yeah. And. You people don't know that. They get lumped and, you know, and she was like, oh, you're not going to help him? I'm like, no, because he was acting like a fool. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is, unfortunately, like, and honestly, I got I got two small kids at home. I got a job at home. I'm not going to, I'm not jeopardizing any of that for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not for sure. a knucklehead. 
That reminds me of uh, 1992. Um, <laughs> we're doing we were, time we were, travel. Okay. I, he mentioned before, I don't really talk about it because we, we played like four shows. I was in a band called Nightfall. Okay. And we were playing... Is that your first band? My first band. Your first band. I, I knew five chords and had a palm mute. That was about it. Hey, they and, had a um, song called <clears throat> Beware of the Night. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> hey. I, I was 15 years old. Dude, it's <laughs> history. We need it. <laughs> wait, wait, what, what, no what, one needs that history. What, what sound were you all... Um, it was like a hardcore thrash. It was okay. like, su- like we suicidal, more, punk, we, to metal, to thrash. Okay. We sounded more hardcore because we were trying to play thrash and we just couldn't. Like oh. that kind of thing. <laughs> sure, that, to be sure, honest with you. Yeah, sure, so sure. we played a show at Obsessions in New Jersey and we would bring oh, all of our crowd with us on a bus. Oh. A lot of my friends, like Dave mentioned before, didn't listen to heavy music. I was music. not on the bus. And we had people drinking all the way there on the buses. It was yeah, a sure. two-hour trip. And they would see people in the pit throwing their fists around because that's when, like, you know, hardcore dancing started becoming popular. So some of my friends thought, you just go in the pit and they punch someone in the people. face. And they just start punching people. There's a huge brawl where two songs into the place, and that was it. It was the, the place shut down. We made that two hour trip. No one got to see the show. And, you know, that it, it was just awful. Like, that uh, was very, very. And, and you can't tell people stay home because you, you want your music to, to branch out. You want. As much as people say underground, everybody wanted the hardcore scene to get bigger yeah, sure, for more sure. people to get into it. Sure. But like when you had people that would go there and say, I'm not going to learn the rules and just go right in the pit and start hitting people, it, it becomes a problem. Uh, yeah. yeah. You just brought back that knuckleheaded memory. <laughs> were you at that show? I was at that you show. You were at that show. Okay. And you I did drove not, out there. I did not go That's on the right. bus. I drove. Were, did, were, were you playing at that show as well? No, I went to the show. I was I was in without a cause. I think i just gotten in. But my friends were part of that New Jersey skinhead scene. Okay, okay. So I was out there. And so they were the ones that were involved with the friends that Frank was talking about. And they were like, Dave, I was like, Bro, I don't know these guys. I don't know what's going on. Just th- they don't understand what, yeah. what, what what this is. This I got is, hit with pepper spray too from it, some girl. Oh, it I, was, I was just trying it, to break it was something just up. Really bad. I was, I was like, and it was like that night. I was so happy. I brought my own car. I was like, Cause I don't want to be wish part I of this. Home with you in your car. <laughs> we should have. And one of the guitars was stolen. I had that show. I had uh, I borrowed my friend's uh, like, rightfully so. Like nineteen eighty BC rich bitch, oh, and wow. someone stole it. I didn't know how to tell him this. Like, like two weeks after, he's like, oh, "Am I gonna get my guitar back?" And I'm like, "Oh God, how do I tell you this?" I, I could have summed it up. He, We're all a bunch of knuckleheads. Yeah. Uh, he took it quite well. I paid him back. Yeah, like it was, good. it was. He was good about it. But still, like my heart was broken because it was a nice guitar. And how old were you in that band? Uh, fifteen to sixteen. Fifteen to sixteen. Somebody yeah. had to be right. twenty-one because they rented the bus. Yeah, we have parents. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Not mine. Mine would be like, go screw you, you not to get lost now. <laughs> I would tell him I was sleeping over at my friend's house. <laughs> so, how, when when did you pick up guitar? How, how um, long before that? About a year before my 15th birthday. Uh, okay. I told my mom I wanted to play. Uh, I had a friend, Pat, that played guitar. Steve, I'm just going to look uh, through a picture I want to show you. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, and I, I started listening to music. I'm like, wow, I really like to play guitar. Like, it's cool. So I talked to my mom, and my, my birthday was coming. So she bought me like a like a cheap starter guitar. It looked like a Fender Strat and a small keychain amplifier. Yeah. We used to call them keychains because they were this big. And uh, I would hang out with Pat, on the, and he would show me a couple of things here and there. And you know, I I've never taken one guitar lesson. Like wow. everything was just self taught. Wow. Um, you know, I now that in the age of YouTube, I can if I don't know how to do something, I can Google it on check it out, yeah. and check it out on YouTube or something. But uh. And I just kept playing and playing and playing, and then we learned a few chords. And friends were like, "Well, let's take this to the stage." Yeah, we sucked, but it, yeah. it was a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, yeah, you put yourself out there. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that helped helped your guitar skills too. Uh, sure, you get better when you're in a band, even if you do because you try. You see, and when you go to shows too, like you'll watch a band and you see a guy playing guitar, and you're like, "How the hell does he do that?" You see, and, and I was the kind of person, yeah. even though I was a bit shy, I would walk up to, them, "How'd you do that?" Like, yeah. you know, and then you learn like like from people, and you know. You just keep progressing. So, yeah. uh, was there a music store in the Bronx that you gravitated? Oh, sure. To? There's Scarlettville. Okay. Okay. O- yeah, over yeah. in Throg's Neck. I yeah. mean, uh, I-, I know it's not open anymore. And when Scarlettville, Scarlettville didn't have what you wanted, you would go to Bronin's, which Bronin's. is where Frank used to work. Bronin's. Bronin's. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure yeah. Lenny mentioned Bronin's that. Bronin's was a much bigger store than Scarlettville, yeah. and 
obviously where where I was in Country Club Throgs Neck area, it was a bit of a ride to Burnham. So yeah. if my parents couldn't drive me there, it was like um, I wait till Scottsville's open to get whatever I needed. Um, yeah, sure. You know, and then we started branching out to like Westchester and stuff like that. There was yeah. Guitar Center, Sam Ash. Sam Ash. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Worst thing ever, man. They gave. Remember that, bro. When we were in four in the chamber, and they gave me a Sam Ash credit card with a thirty five hundred dollar credit limit. Yeah, that How lasted quick? about two minutes. <laughs> yeah, we I went, want this new. We Ibanez. went shopping. <laughs> I want this new graphite Ibanez base. I'm like Dave. I don't know if graphite's um, a good somebody material. Somebody got a head out of that deal. <laughs> oh, I needed a yes, head. Yes, you did. Which head? So you, I know I got a heart. No, key not and, me. Yeah, well, all right, whatever. <laughs> yeah, planet, planet from the. I bought my, I bought my PV from Bronin's. I bought my Mesa from Guitar Center and my uh, Valve State. I bought he has from no accountability. Connecticut from uh, East Coast Music Mall in Connecticut. Those are three heads I ever had. Yeah, yeah. Steve, I'm going to send you pictures because yeah, Wi Fi is bad here. Send them to me. Um, and yeah, what about you? Did what, what music stores did you go to? Sam Ash, Sam Bronin's. Ash Bronin's. Bronin's. Listen, when I when we joined Without a Cause, when I went there, it was it was Bronin's all the time. Yeah, it was Bronin's or. Me and Lenny used to. I remember I got my tar card, my car towed one day when I went. Me and Lenny went to Sam Ash in Manhattan. He's like, "Oh no, we can park here." Oh yeah, the come, meters were there. Come back, cars up too. on the thing. I'm like, "Wow, this is gonna suck." <laughs> That's a whole. Uh, but it was a lot of it was Bronin's. I, I never really went to Schuylerville because, yeah. again, I was in co-op, so that was the other. Yeah, end. it's not like that was. I remember like going to Sam Asher a bunch of times and thinking I'm in like Candyland. Like, this is the well, coolest place ever. Well, I would imagine you living in co-op that Bronin's would be easier for you because you just jump on the 12 bus yeah, and yeah, go yeah. right across where Skylerville was a bit of a hike. Yeah. For yeah. me, it was a half hour walk. It was good times. And Dave, did you start with bass or did you start I with I started with bass. You started with bass. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yep. Because there was no way I could play guitar. It's too many notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't was was that. that your main thinking in going to bass? I don't know, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but not. Like, truth be told, this is how it went down. Uh, we need a bass player. Okay, I'm going to No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, my brother's bar mitzvah. He had extra money. He wanted to play guitar. So we went to Sam Ash. He bought a guitar. I was like, he was like, do you want something? I'm like, well, I don't want to play guitar because you're playing guitar. Yeah. So I was like, bass. And then also I was uh, watching Cliff Burton. I was like, oh, this looks interesting yeah so yeah and how old were you when you got the bass oh my god 17 okay because okay, yeah. carnage started in eight when i was 18 yeah. so and you don't really truly like develop oh well, that was loud how settling <laughs> well listen it's just you learn a lot from the guys that you know you play in bands with and it, at first you feel like this guy's a fucking jerk off yeah like, they're hard. Like, Frank was very hard. I pl I got to play with both Franks from Fahrenheit and him. They were very hard. But yeah. now you look back at it all these years later, like, yeah, you know what? Can they're you define hard? <laughs> Erect? No, no, that's... No, that's just like, they were, they were regimented in yeah. what they wanted, and they knew how far they could push you to get something done. Yeah. And, and again, I, I always, always, you know, like, I, I've told him before i was like you know i know now why you were the way you were and it's just you know back then it's just like oh dude come on it's supposed to be fun this isn't fun yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but now you look back and you're like eh, yeah you know it kind of had a point yeah uh, kind of had a point so I, I always felt that the work was most important and then the fun came later like, yeah you know being in a band is supposed to be fun and it is but when you're working you gotta work yeah. it's not you know, uh, we had drummers in the past that would show up to practice every time, not knowing the song. You give them a tape. Yeah, I'm going to go listen to it. And then a week later, like, and then you ask a question oh. and it's like a, a third grade, like school excuse, like dog ate my homework. Yeah. Like, you know, like, why didn't you practice? Oh, well, uh, you know, I thought you were going to do it. So, uh, our, like, our drummer in front of the chamber was like that originally. It was just, I like, wasn't naming names or people. It's all right. I'm, I'm not, fine. I'm, I'm, I'm going to call it what it is because the past is the past. And, you know, it's part of history. So yeah. it's just, but again, it goes back to the part of, you know, because at first it starts out being fun. And then it's like, wait a minute, we can start doing some cool things and still be fun. Yeah. But your sound's got to progress. Yeah. And you got to put the work in. And yeah. So this Frank and other Franks, 
point, like, they were very regimented, and they knew their instruments, and they knew what they wanted stuff to sound like, and, like, and, again. And that's the thing, if your band isn't on the same page, all, mem all the members, then it becomes discourse. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a time in Four in the Chamber where I wanted to bring the band in one direction, Dave wanted to go in another, and our other old singer Bobby wanted to bring it in a third direction, wow. and we were all, like, kind of, like, pushing against each other, like, with no common ground. That's yeah. why the band fell apart towards the end, because, so the, I don't know if we want to go, like, we want to start with the original, like... Um, are we there yet? Or are we, we we'll, there yet? We'll, uh, we'll get there in a... We'll All right, when you, yeah. when you get there, when you take us there. Yeah. Um, Director. <laughs> no, but let's uh, let's take a little bit more with um, kind of the Lehman, oh, end of Lehman okay. years. Um, and, well, you graduated before I did. Oh, so... Dave, why don't you say more about the, the first band you were in? All right. <laughs> We've heard some of Frank's war stories from his first band. Oh, God. So... Violent Carnage, first band. I know Lenny wanted me to make sure that I mentioned it. Text me this morning to remind <laughs> me that I was. I said I'm not skipping it. It's part of history. Yeah. So again, Lehman was cool when it came to supporting that. They had something called Battle of the Bands. Uh -huh. So it was fucking awesome. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, the year before we played, uh, Requiem played with Demolition Hammer. This kid, Ryan, jumped off the stage, stage dive, broke both wrists. Nobody caught him, obviously. So, we played... Uh, so, I'm going to rewind back. We had a freaking... Uh, like, every band starts out this way when they're young. We had a disaster show. Yeah, It was disaster. We sucked. It was awful. And it was bad. So, we were like, oh, the battle. We'll get redemption. Redemption. And the big prize, it was like $60. Yeah, we did. I think it was more right. bragging rights, right? Yeah, it was like bragging rights. So, you know, we, you lock yourself in my old drummer, Dennis Burns' basement, and we we just practiced and practiced, and we played the show. But the, the Lehman stage was like a like a real stage with real lighting and smoke machine, and we had a big banner done in graffiti. Wow. It was cool as hell, but, like, they they made us like when we spoke to the person in charge of like well there can't be any moshing I'm like and they put that sign up big they put it like no <laughs> moshing no stage diving so what do you think kids are gonna do mosh and stage dive oh, no stage diving oh, okay, okay we were okay, safe okay, okay. okay but the moshing was got pretty out of control yeah. for now I look back and I'm like what a joke I've seen well, so much if worse. you remember the year you guys won the battle with Carnage uh, they stopped the show yes because kids started oh, going off yeah. And, uh, was late Miss Morantz. Yeah. That was her name. She, she came out show. and she stopped the show and said, do you like this band? And everyone's like, yeah. And she's like, then you need to stop. And then we're like, okay, because I was in the pit as well at that time. Uh, and it, it was just a funny time because it's like, you have this music that you want to like, like just like get aggressive to. Four know, chord thrash music, All my friends baby. are up on stage doing their thing and like, you can't move because there's somebody telling you you can't. <laughs> so that was like the most un, the most unhardcore thing ever. You know, it was unmetal, unhardcore, oh unpunk rock. It was just, I was like, all right, it's kind of me while I'm out there with my. Do, do you remember how you spent the sixty bucks you won? Yeah, we were repairing somebody's car that they crashed. <laughs> it was just, it just like kids doing things, yeah. but it was cool because you got to like, all right, this is my hometown. We put up. I remember postering. Every lamppost with flyers, the cheese. I'm going to send you all this stuff. You're going to love you, it. You, you still have the I have flyers. the flyers. Wow. I have the cheesy logos. Oh it's like posting them on all over Tremont Avenue as wow. I come to the show. It, it was great, man. And it was just, uh, listen, I there's really, it's hard because Bronx really doesn't have venues. Yeah. Like yeah. they either come and they go, but your high school, you owned your high school. And it was bragging rights and I look back at it now and I'm like damn because originally I started out I was uh, I, don't, I don't even remember how I got like in touch or like with Requiem but I wound up like roadieing for James the bass player and he was giving me lessons for a bit and it was just like honestly that's another guy I own I owe a ton to those guys because yeah. Listen, I'm sure that was like, oh, Dave's hanging out. We'll make him carry our shit. 
But, like, that got me into, like, going to their shows and watching what they did kind of lit the fire in my ass. Like, oh, well, we can do the same thing. I yeah. mean, we can have jobs and have equipment and do stuff. And But back then, it was, the process was so different. Like, I, I'm going to tell you this story because <coughs> it's got to go on record. So, now, if you want to get a CD printed or a shirt printed, like... I call my shirt guy and it's done. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like back then, we had me and my my guitar player Scott got on. I don't know. We went to some all the way from the Bronx. He lived in Tremont. I live in Co-op City. Went all the way to some place in Jersey to go to a place where like they're showing us a package deal of metal originals. Yeah, metal that originals, tapes oh and uh, tapes and T-shirts for yeah. like back then three hundred and sixty-five dollars. So I remember, now think about what that is now, but yeah. these are two like 18 year old kids wow. and bro, it how was are we going to save money. up for this? Yeah. How that are we going to do money. this? We got to do this. We got to have this demo tape. But again, it all goes back to Requiem because yeah. I saw them doing posters and doing tapes and I was like, well, we got to, we got to have our brand yeah, and this yeah, is yeah. how you promote your brand. Yeah. So it was just like, it's a lot, being in a band is a lot of things that most people don't think about like. Okay, we're gonna have a job. We gotta pay for this. Uh, how are we getting to the show? Yep. How are we, you know, <laughs> back then it was like Frank's mo- Frank's mother hated the fact that he played in a band. <laughs> I swear to God, am I wrong? Not as much as my father did. <laughs> oh, like every every time we go to pick him up, where are you guys going? She used to take my when I when I used to get in trouble in school. She used to take my guitar away. That's it. You punish someone. You can't take it away from me. Oh yeah. So you know, my mom worked full time, so she would take it away from me, put it in her room, so I would play it when she was at work and put it back before she came. But um, yeah, those were you know, for everything you gain, one gain you have with the band, you sacrifice three other things. Yeah. I always used to say, like, uh, you know, you you may have got your music out and and um. You pay. You had to save up money to get all these these uh, demos and and buy all this equipment, and that's a great thing. But then you sacrifice vacations with your friends when it's just a guy's trip, and uh, in some cases you don't go to college. Yep. And uh, yeah, mm. and uh, you know mm. you may uh, lose one other thing. I, I nothing comes to mind right now. Yeah, music sure. cost me my second wife, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She tells me every day. Wow, yeah, yeah. So, sacri- but listen, I, I had some really great <clears throat> experiences that I, you got some very wise advice from somebody in the scene once, I'm not going to name it, but always said, it's not about the money, It's because there is none. Yeah. It's not about, you know, anything. It's about the experiences and making the experiences and traveling to different places and making that connection and going to see... You, you, you're you're 6,000 miles from your house or your home, but you got a guy singing your lyrics or wearing your shirt. That That's the experience. Yeah. Listen, hardcore music has gotten me. I went to Europe and roadied for no redeeming social value wow. once, which is a great experience, which showed me how to do a European tour and what it goes. Then we got to go to Europe with Four in the Chamber, which was... A pretty awesome experience for the most part, except it started uh, off awesome. It kind yeah, of we'll, we'll, we'll go into that later. Yeah. It started off really awesome, and then you know, labels. That's all I gotta say, yeah. man. Yeah. Kids, <laughs> labels ain't what they're supposed to be. But but that would be the third thing of my you you lose three things would be relationships. Yeah, sure. If if you're like 18, 19, 20, 21, and you start to meet ladies or uh, you know, and they, they're interested, you're interested. They're like, well, what are you doing this weekend? Well, I have three shows. Like. What are you doing the following week? I have three shows. No one sticks around for that. What are you doing Monday, Tuesday? Yeah. You've got practice. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then after a while, like, in the beginning, if a girl's into the same music, they're like, oh, that's cool. Like, I'll come to your shows. All right. Yeah. But then, when, where, especially where I'm from in the Bronx, nobody really liked hardcore metal. Yeah, sure. So sure. every girl that I would meet was into, like, freestyle uh-huh. and hip-hop. So when I told them I was in those kind of bands, they were like, nope. Sorry. I'm good. And like, you know, I would have girlfriends, but they we would wind up splitting either. I would leave them because I, I just didn't have any interest. Yeah, sure. Because I was more focused on the band, or they would get tired of me never being around and, and uh, they would leave me. So yeah. it would just it, it yeah. just you 
If you're going to play in a band, it's really hard to have a solid relationship. For yeah. You're making me sad, bro. <laughs> so, yeah. just like we were talking about, uh, so Four in the Chamber got to go to Europe, and then after that, what I learned there and the connections and contacts I made there helped my other band, Apparition, go to Europe again. And to have those same connections that I made from Four in the Chamber, that that's what it's about. And then uh, I, I was blessed enough to go to South America and play music in South America wow. with Apparition, which was... But again, this all stemmed from Four in the Chamber having these contacts. And But when you start to see how this New York sound and bands from your area affect these other it's another continent yeah. and I, I'm just gonna tell this really quick story because it was really one of the most eye-opening poignant and like best vibe energy I, I, I think I have a lot of like top moments in bands and this is probably like my, my South American trip was very eye-opening to how lucky we are to have what we have in America because I saw my first shanty town and it was heartbreaking, but I also saw the warmth those people had down there and the generosity for the, they had nothing, but they were ready to sh give a shirt if you're back. Yeah. So just two things that I'll tie back to the Bronx. Um, played a show in Valparaiso. I'm wearing a Billy Club sandwich shirt. Yeah. It's a, I'm a big dude. It's yeah. a 4X. Yeah. This guy comes over to me and he's pointing at the shirt and he's going, BCS, BCS. And I said, yeah, the great, great band, good friends, awesome music. And he keeps pointing at the shirt. I'm like, you want the shirt? Yeah. And this guy is like this big. Yeah. And I was like, he's like, really? Really? I'm like, I took the shirt off. My fat <laughs> ass is sweaty. And I'm, <laughs> Don't ever do he, that again. He puts, <laughs> he puts the shirt on and he's rocking it and he's all like, I'm like, bro, this is what it's about. Wow. This is awesome 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 as hell and then we played uh santiago the night before and true story you can all my band members and apparition were there we, we cover irate's vendetta yeah last song we close it out and i've never seen anything like, like all of a sudden you have kids going ballistic and i'm sitting there in my head i'm like here i am 8,000 miles away and we're covering a band from the Bronx, New York and there were kids going ape crap to it. Like the Bronx and this band's music has reached all the way here and these lyrics have impacted this this many kids. Yeah. I was like, this is, I call, I remember I messaged Phil or something like that. I was like, then he goes, did you have it on video? I'm like, no. <laughs> Nobody thought of it because yeah. I had my singer by the back of her belt. Yeah. Because they were pulling her off the stage, which was like 10 feet high, yeah. to sing. And I'm like, I didn't think of it. But I was just like, a huge, I was like, there's a win for the Bronx today, wow. man. Wow. Go Yankees. Wow. But it was just a cool Billy Club Irate story that it was just like, so this little area here reached all the way down there and impacted those kids. And that's what hardcore and punk and metal are all about. Yeah. Sorry to digress. I just had no, to get... No, that's a great I wanted digression. that story told. That's a great digression. Um, and you mentioned a little bit ago about, like, just, you know, how one of the difficulties about the, the Bronx scene is just the venues, you know, not being a stable thing. Um, Do you want to open one? Is that what you're saying? No. <laughs> if, I, 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 if I had any money. If I had $400,000, <laughs> I'm with you, man. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But I was going to ask you... Um, what's the first show you went to in the Bronx outside of Lehman High School? Hmm. I, I gotta be honest. It would be... Were either of y'all at the Chippewa Club? Oh, I played that. Okay, okay. Oh, so, yeah, okay. That's, I, that's right. why I wanted that's to, 92. I wanted to give, I want to pass it to Frank okay, yeah, before let's, I let's go. Frank. The Chippewa Club, I, that that's was, in Westchester that was Square, in Westchester right? Square, right? Yeah. Yes. I, I never played that place. We were supposed to as Nightfall, but then we just started to not like each other. We broke up, but Alang's show place to see like actual outside of Lehman was probably the Black Phone. Oh, the um, Black Phone, really? Yeah, That's right down. That was right down. Or the Train Depot. Train, train Depot. Depot. So I, I played, so I was in Without a Cause and, and then I know, so we played the Chippewa Club. Yeah. Which was, and that was to me, that was the big step from Lehman to seeing, wow, there's another, whole nother 
community of metalheads and hardcore kids out. And, and listen, that, that's another thing I just want to go on record and, and just make sure. Because my friend at that time, Anita, was dating the singer Without a Cause. And, yeah. and she got me into that group. And again, th- there would be probably no interest in me continuing in the hardcore if I didn't meet Lenny. Yeah. Let, walking into Lenny's room. And I'm a kid from Co-op City in the Bronx, and you walk into Lenny's room, and there was a huge wall of just tape cassettes. Wow. For, like, you want to talk about musical historian? That guy oh, knows know. everything. But there was every hardcore thing. Like, he opened, like, bands that I never even heard of. And after that, I was just like, it's just like when somebody hands you uh, a new car. Yeah. With new keys, like, oh my God, like, I got this man is dope as hell. I got introduced to Leeway through there. Oh, sure, sure. And, uh, like, Judge and other bands, the Gorilla Biscuits. Sure. So, to me, it was just like, I again, you you make your friends in music, and it, it's funny how we're all still communication and, and talking, and it's just like, you look back at it, it feels like so long ago. But it's like the impact of just like stupid, silly things like Miss Ingerman's guitar class. It, it changed its course and direction of people. Uh, my friend Anita uh, dating the singer without a cause and then me meeting up with Lenny. It just changes course and direction. Yeah. But uh, Chippewa. Sorry, I'm all over the place. That's because, you know, OCD, ADD, whatever. Chippewa Club was awesome. That's where... Um, Frank Fahrenheit was playing with, an, uh, I believe it was either another band or Close Call that night. Yeah, That's yeah. where I met Mike uh, that night for the first time. Barry Godementis. If you watch that video, I, we could put arrows on a it. A Every, lot of people were there. At, think, everybody. Right? Listen, there's plenty of videos where you could put. Uh, then we played, there was a church we played with uh, Close Call. And that's the church Lenny mentioned. Yes. Or the, what was the name of it? Uh, the Metal, Metal the Madness. Madness or, or something. Two like. or something. But and where was that church? That was in the South Bronx. That was in the South Bronx. I'm okay. pretty sure because, again, I'm a kid from co-op. Yeah. And my whole, now you're seeing there's a whole, other than Lehman High School, wow, there's a whole bunch more of like-minded kids into this music. Again, it's just, and since we're on the topic of, doing shows and it was just you start to see I, I never went to the train depot yeah I, I never went there for any shows or I mean and they had some good shows from yeah. the flyers I've seen now and it was like wow okay but it wasn't it wasn't around for that long no it was like even. like a year not even yeah. a year or two it was a short most venues aren't around a long time yeah um, yeah yeah I think when we started four in the chamber it wasn't even like by the it time it was just we, ending when we yeah when, by the time we were ready to go for shows it was like gone yeah. we're like See, the thing with the Bronx is, the Bronx, as we all know, is very big. Yeah, yeah. And where Dave is from in co-op, where I'm from in Throg's Neck Country Club, I, I ne- never really could say where I'm from, because like, yeah, sure, it's always sure, Country sure. Club, Throg's Neck. Um, there is a very small community of people that listen to heavy music. Yeah. So, And I'm talking, like, you could probably count them on your fingers and toes, like yeah. that many people. Because everybody was, like, you know, Guido Italian, um... You know, hey, I'm going to go get the new Cynthia record that's coming out and all this other stuff. Did you get the new Stevie B? Not that there's anything wrong with Stevie B. Dave, growing up in co-op, there there was no metalheads in co-op. Yeah. And then you find out that there's a whole group of people that live on the other side of the Bronx that don't look like you. And it's like the greatest thing in the world. Except back then there was no internet. Yeah. So, like, you didn't know about it. Yeah, so, you're sure. hearing about it and you're like, what do you mean? Like, those guys over there, they're, they're, they're not into metal. Like, and then you find out that everybody's, there's a bigger scene on the other side of the Bronx than in your own neighborhood. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah, like, like, cause you the just, eye opening. And, yeah. and especially when you're young, your world is that little zone you're in. Of you course. can't, you can't comprehend something outside that zone. Yeah. So, like, now, like, you know, 30 years later, it's like, wow. Like, like you know, if there was the internet back then, back then, I think hardcore would have been much bigger in the Bronx. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it, if it were if it were easier to get you know from one part of the Bronx to the other too, I mean, it's sure. such a pain. Even you gotta go now, into the city and come yeah. back. Like now, it's just like with Uber and yeah. all Lyft and all this stuff. It's so 
I don't know. It's easier, but if you Somebody to... needs to spend some money and open... Oh, I said that. <laughs> We're just saying that again, man. It's just... Yeah, I know. It, it just... To have all these... I mean, you're doing the documentary, you're doing this thing, and you, you're looking at these bands that all... It's crazy. Yeah. And why were bands very big in Brooklyn besides some of the Brooklyn bands were amazing. Yeah. But why were they big? They had Lamar. Yep. You know, we yep. never had a Lamar a in the A stable box. venue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, Same with the Lower East Side. I mean, yeah. multiple, multiple. Wetlands, CBs, yeah, 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 yeah. Pyramid. Yeah, but you know? they did shows every so often. Well, the Pyramid did it for a while, but the Wetlands would do a hardcore show every so often. It and wasn't like every weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Lamar, it was this weekend's this metal band. Next week's that point. metal band. Yeah. Very fair All right, point. maybe the following week's a glam uh, venue, but yeah, yeah. it's like, it, it, there was always something going on there. Here, we would have a place like the Blackthorn that would do shows once, uh, heavy shows once a month if we're lucky. Yep. There was more bands than dates that they could put in a year, so it was yeah. really hard for everybody to to get on shows. Like, uh, you know. I, I agree. It's just, it's, a, it's a shame when you look back at it like there's... But, you know, I gotta be honest, man. Every band that... You know, started in the Bronx. They worked their asses off, and they did it. To... Listen, there were times. Uh, I mean, again, I I'll tell some. These are pretty funny stories. Remember when we were coming home? I think it was from. Uh, we were playing four in the chamber. We were playing in Delaware, and we stopped at a random rest stop in New Jersey. Ran into Indecision at the same rest stop. They wow. were coming from another another show. They were playing. There was just like times where like you don't talk to these bands all the time but you're pulling up at a venue and like there's uh uh we play a show remember a show in new jersey that got canceled we we showed up and i rape was there already and they're like oh show's canceled <laughs> and but it was just like rant like these bands worked so hard man and whether it was it was they bought a van which we had a band a van we called it megatron <laughs> the cage on the front don't i'll that's a we'll talk about frank's uh he has he likes violence when it comes to his fan. When I was younger, <laughs> when he was younger, but it was just like bands what bands bands invested more. or you know what they all, we all piled into cars. I mean I remember times when we went picked up Fahrenheit in like five different cars to go play a show oh, in wow. Queens. It was just like yeah, with Lenny Frank and me were sitting in traffic on the um, on the RFK bridge at the time. Tried it just on. like bands worked very hard to get out there and you didn't have these resources back then. It was yeah. like, you know, we did a weekend run with go to Memphis. We rented a van. That was we, fun. We all piled in. To, yes, it was. it was. It was fun. It was oh, an interesting God. weekend. Yeah. So Those guys are always fun. To hang oh out. my God. Barry still talks ba about it. Barry is, is class. I'll class leave that one for Barry can tell that story. Make a <laughs> mental note, Steve. That's uh, all for we'll Barry. Do. We'll That's do. All, that, have but, Barry uh, tell the story. But like, yeah, you would drive all the way to the venue and find out it was canceled because the promoter never booked a day. Or, like, uh, remember when we drove, it was like 98, we drove to Siena College uh, oh. in upstate New York. We oh, get there, there's a piece God. of oak tag on a, on a parking ballast that said, like, uh, show canceled tonight. Oh, like, my God. I was like, it took us three hours to get there. It was three hours. There was a snowstorm the day before. It was probably six degrees outside. And it was like, we just drove all this way. In addition, like, you take off work and you lose the day back then. Yep. And, and, you know, you you might... I mean, I miss family weddings yep. for shows and, and, and things like that. So. Childbirths, family weddings, uh -huh. you know. But you sacrifice for your love, your passion. Now, Dave, your uh, brother-in-law... Tito yes. mentioned some, or I mean, I you know, I've, I've seen it on the flyers before, the BDC. Is that something y'all were involved in? We were not. We were not in the BDC. Okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, the way he described it, I mean, I, he, we're going to record with him too, so he'll say more about it. But it was very interesting, at least the way he described it. Is, I know I have pictures of the meetings in my in my ex-wife's living room. Like, <laughs> like people would share instruments and, and help coordinate mm -hmm. You know, getting the shows and all, and and that was a really interesting thing to me. I mean, it, it, it speaks that's to, the spirit of hardcore said, yeah. and the spirit of listen. That that was, I, I think that still happens. Now. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> it for definitely sure. still happens because there's plenty of. T but yeah, they had a very. I mean, Tito and Barry can definitely and and Motley probably could elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah, yeah. they were very well organized to what you know getting there if they needed equipment. Listen, equipment was very expensive. It wasn't like, 
shit, man. Especially if it's sounding good. Like, yeah. You save up yeah, everything yeah. you have. Like, it, uh, listen, I just bought a new head to play with. I just spent 1500 Oh, you 15, finally got some. Well, because I'm crippled now, and I, I can't I can't wear around a 50-pound amp. Yeah, yeah. And so I got a new amp. It was like just seven pounds. Thank you, Muttley. Thank you, Kevin Fahrenheit. You recommended it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> What'd you get? Uh, Black Glass. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful amp, but it's like eight pounds, bro. That's amazing. I put it in my, oh, side, my, my computer bag. Wow. Like, it wasn't like that back in the day. It was like... Huge. <laughs> huge. My amplifier weighs 150 pounds. It oh still does. <laughs> and, nobody, and then at the end of a show, nobody wants to load the van. No. Nobody wants to load it. No. That's why back in the... Our, our singer was so... Before we got the van, he was so cheap. So cheap. He's like, yeah, here's what we're going to do. But you know what? <laughs> Look back on it now. It was pretty smart. Like, we'll just bring our heads and guitars and cymbals, and we'll get in a car, and we'll just go for the weekend. And we just borrowed everything else. But, okay. you know, Until that yeah, one yeah. time where we got there and the bands were all like, sorry, we don't know, not did you equip me? <laughs> yeah, it didn't work very well. That was well. Phoenixville, the second time we went to play uh, in Pennsylvania. We're not I'll never you. forget that. And then the singer goes up, uh, the, not the singer, the promoter goes on stage to announce we're not playing because we, we drew quite a few people that night. And it was four in the chamber will not be playing because they couldn't afford a van. I got so <laughs> mad at him. I was like, it wasn't we couldn't afford a van, it's you weren't paying us enough to get a van. Oh my God. So I guess we couldn't afford a van. Well, probably. Um, so so let's let's talk a little bit about the formation of four in the chamber. How did how did that happen? Wow, I got some good. This could be good. Why don't you tell your story and I'll tell mine? Yeah, let's hear, let's hear both versions. Because you never reached out to me, Cedric did. So. Oh. Okay, whatever. I'm gonna try not to go on to that topic much. Uh, so, without a cause, was evolving into Fahrenheit. Truth be told, I wasn't pulling my weight. Yeah. And they had to make a choice to go forward. Again, still love those guys and support those guys. Their new uh, two-song EP is out now. Yes, fire. Straight it fire. It's in my car right now. So uh, I wanted to do something. I wanted to, I wanted to keep playing. Uh, so looking around the area, it was like, all right, who's in the area? So I had a friend uh, that I worked at Pathmark with that said he could sing. John. So I was like, okay. Um, so we started. Then we got somebody else that said they could play guitar. Couldn't play That's guitar. like me saying I could perform open heart surgery. It's good. <laughs> he could he play could play not guitar. play guitar. He owned a guitar. So he, he got in touch with Frank. So I already knew Frank could play guitar, so yeah. I was excited. I was like, oh, this is going to be good. So then we had a drummer. DJ was the first drummer. No, Kevin, it's your drummer. It was our first drummer. Oh, wow. I totally forgot about that. His original drummer from The Nightfall oh, was our original drummer. Oh, that was your original drummer. Okay. We, went through, we went through a lot of drummers. Uh, and we had a keyboard player. And we had a keyboard player. Oh, you had a keyboard player. Originally. So if, that, if there's any tapes out there, which yeah, there aren't. There aren't. Classically uh, trained keyboard player. He's amazing. Wow. Man, if the vision of the band would have actually... Honestly, if the, if the key, I thought the keyboard shit was cool as hell. What, what, like, what kind of stuff would he do? It would have been, it, you would have probably had something that was on the verge of biohazard with keyboards. Oh, wow. Like, he would, he would like, just accent what you were playing. But the, the problem was, he was such a great pianist that, well, yeah, he was a little, you know, sweetheart of a guy. He was. He, um, but he, he it, it wasn't fulfilling him. Like he wanted to be like, dude, like you know, playing the theme. He to wanted peanuts. to play like Dream Theater. Like, and it, oh, wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't like it wasn't working for him. So, yeah. you know that band Dragon Force? He'd be right yeah. in there right now. <laughs> I, I remember. So Dave was talking to Cedric about getting in the band, and I knew Cedric from school. This is our original uh, guitar player. Yeah. Um, but we'll say singer also because we kicked him off guitar. We're like, dude, you can't play. Just sing. <laughs> and, uh, Couldn't play. So uh, I know. Cedric called me at my job, and I thought he wanted to play softball because we were in like the same softball league. And I yeah. say, I said, like, and I, I used to play baseball and softball all the time. And he's like, you still play guitar? I'm like, yeah. He's like, want to play with Dave Mitchell and all, and Kagum and your old band, we're going to put together a band. I was like, hey, I got nothing else to do. So uh, that's how the band started. And then, we had Kegum, and then Kegum and I had a disagreement, and he quit. I totally forgot about this. And then uh, I'm still friends with him. Um, yeah. He he quit, and then we it spent just like a year looking for a drummer, and then 
we got another guy, DJ, who played a few practices, then he quit. And then, he would uh, have not been there anyway. We really so looked hard for John. John was working at a radio station okay. in Long Island. Yeah, and that's where we found Anthony and Steve, the other guitar player. Oh, and then okay. we were now six people in a band called Four in the Chamber. It made no sense, but hey. So then up. we had three, four guys, wait, four guys from the Bronx and a Long Island, six people. You try to put that on stage. That many people on stage. Luckily, you and I were still skinny back then. We were. We were. You want to talk about just... A lot of people on stage. Of people. It was just. It, it was a train wreck. I don't. I just thought it was. That's a and, lot of people. It kinda, was Slipknot before <laughs> Slipknot. We kind of rushed the band too. Like uh, we did. We, we started playing shows before we were even close to be ready. Wow. And like, uh, like we we were playing shows and like, like not everybody knew what they were supposed to be playing like that time. So, you know, the first buzz for us when we first started playing was this band is so horrible. Like, yeah. and we were because we weren't tight and. Yeah. And stuff, and then after this guy Steve left his uh, our other guitar player, I think it was just me, right? For a while, he left to go uh, pursue his career bodybuilding. Oh, wow, and and taking roids. We started to, no, no, really. Oh, wow, seriously, oh, wow. yeah, because we he, saw he came to one of our, he was proud of it, though. Yeah, he was coming to one of our yeah, shows, yeah, yeah. and I was like, bro, what the hell? Couldn't put his arms down. I'm like, bro, what, what did you do to yourself? Yeah. I'm on the roids. <laughs> So he, he couldn't even put his arm around his tongue. Yeah, it would never work. So he anymore. left, and we kept his drummer, because it was his drummer. He brought the drummer on. And uh, the five of us just started playing for a long time, and then we, we started to get on the same page yeah. of what we were doing musically, and that's when we recorded our first... Uh, Will six Drive album. Studio? No, no, no. That's, uh, the... I, there's a we had a de we had a CD done that was just so bad we couldn't re release it. Like we recorded it's, with it's this history, guy. bro. I'm, yeah. I'm giving We're, history. Yeah, that, was that 97? No, 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 no. 96. Oh, 96. 96. This was. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. We had a, a demo that was so bad. So you never uh, a CD we, we couldn't release it. So so this is again. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I got to fill in the, the blanks. Well, yeah, I yeah, 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 so. You did. You did. You did good. You're up there. So we. I brought the. I had a friend at the time, Kevin Gill, that owned SFT Records. Fahrenheit was on a shutdown, yeah, no sure. redeeming, neck, uh, 25 to life. I brought him the, 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 the said demo that he was talking about. Yeah. He goes, he played it, he's like, you, you can't, you can't put release this, it. You he can't, was right. You can't put this out. 100% right, but again, that's what you do. You go to your friends uh -huh. you for an input, input. Yep. and he's like, I have a guy that I know in Pennsylvania, in Westchester, Pennsylvania, so... Us guys from the Bronx at that point, this is what we're like, oh, this is great. We'll make it into a whole thing. So we, went, we did a weekend, right? We stayed in a hotel with an indoor pool. All right. Because it was three and a half hours away. Yeah, yeah. So sure. we're acting like complete and utter idiots, but the recording got done. and It was decent. That was the Unstable Foundation record. Yeah, and yeah. so it came out and I played it for Kevin again. And he was like, see? And I was like, okay, so we got something there. Uh, he helped us with a lot of the, the marketing because back then it wasn't like digital ads. It yeah, was sure. take out ads in magazines. And I hope it, people see you at shows. And we don't know anything about that. And then the band starts to get a little traction and we start playing as many shows as humanly possible. Uh, at that point, right before the record, Cedric never recorded on that record. Yeah. It, they, he just he was gone by then. It was just not gonna work. And yeah, too much baggage. You won't I'm not bringing him up again because he sure. had a, he had a legal issue, and I kind of disavowed all. Unfortunately, yeah, you, okay. you could try and be friends with someone, but you can't. You can't. I can't. Change can't choose it. their path. I gave them a lot of chances, so uh, we put the record out. Started to get a lot of good feedback. Got a, a lot of good sing-alongs and stuff, which is what you do music for, you know good reactions and we're like okay here we go what, what's next and here's where we go so I, I don't know where Chris got in contact was it John he got in touch with John because it was being sold through distro in Europe right and so, uh, at the time we were offered a contract with uh, Kingfisher Records which were a subsidiary of Century Media sure. which they put Century Media on the actual album itself and they signed us to do an, an album for them which was great like all right i'm on a, i'm on a label but it's not great kids it was, there was no tour support there was no uh advertisement they just basically gave us money to put a re record out and that was it good luck that was it. 
And so, I'll tell you a really great story of being on the phone with their A&R representative. So Chris got me the contact. I get on the phone with this guy. I'm like, so can you get us some shows or something? We can't give you any money. Uh, I didn't ask for any money. I asked you for like booking contacts, hooking up with shows. At the time, you had Stuck Mojo, who was very big at the time. I was like, opening slot? Yeah. We have a van. Uh, you know, we don't care about driving. We can't give you any money. It was basically a, so at that uh, point, I'm like, yeah, this is just not going to go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the problem with going on, on that label was... A lot of things. Well, <laughs> the main thing for us was they didn't give us enough money to really record. The contract oh, said that the God. record had to be more than like 60 minutes long, which if you're a hardcore band, that's really hard. Wow. And I Impossible. mentioned to our A&R guy, he's like, well, if it's in the contract, you have to. And I'm like, there's no way. So we wound up putting out an overbloated CD that had 13 songs, I think it has. Yeah. That just was a train wreck. I'm not going to lie. It, it's the recording, because we didn't have any money, like didn't sound that well quality. At the time, our drummer already felt like he was a rock star, didn't practice oh. his parts, came in unrehearsed. His drum sounded like shit. Oh. Um yeah, you know, I, even I, I tried to do way too much on that record, yeah. and we um young, just young kids that are handed an opportunity yeah, that they like, don't understand. Like, there's too many like movie intros for for some of the songs, and you know, though some of the songs could be halfway decent, they just the the album was a train wreck, and some people liked it, which you know, a lot of people out. liked it. But did you <laughs> existence twenty one thousand people like William Hung, <laughs> right? When yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 20, 21,000 copies of that record sold for Century Media. And you know what the royalty check I got from How Century much? Media? Oh $1.65. You owe me half of that, by the way. Um, <laughs> you got yours. I don't know what you did with it. But the $1.65, whole, the whole, kids. The, and the fact that we, were, we weren't, you know, we were young when, when we recorded Existence. That was 97, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, no, 2001. No, Existence came out in 98. Are you sure? Yeah, it came Just out in 98. Do your homework. Hold on. The Google machine. Um, I believe it came out in ninety eight or ninety nine. The so, only because I know Europe. So it's like twenty two years old. Europe yeah. was two thousand. And we were we were flat broke. Like yeah, you sure. know, we were getting enough it shows to maybe cover gas money and, and stuff. So, you know, we we're given a small amount that's not even enough to really do a demo. Yeah. And we go to the same place we recorded the first CD, and like we we tried to do a thirteen song record in a whole weekend with. Ooh. Everybody doing their parts. Like, if you listen to the record by the by the later songs, Singer, John is hoarse. Blown out. Like, uh, like, uh, and, and when we were recording it, like the guitar sounds were awesome. Like everything sounded great. It just, it just fell apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and you know, I take a lot of that. I take a lot of the the blame for that. Like, I tried to do way too much. Like I said, we all tried to do way too much. And you know, it, it was a good experience, but the band started to kind of. Kingfisher didn't want to put out a second record after that. Yeah. Um, well, you're leaving out a massively well, huge thing. Correct me where I left out. Well, so now it, the, the whole crux of doing the record with Kingfisher was to go to Europe. Yeah. That was the crux. And listen, 20 something year old band that, you know, from the Bronx, like, this is cool. So. We got to go to Europe. We we played the With Full Force Festival with bands like uh, Megadeth and Soulfly and Judas Priest and, and Sick of It All. Don't leave them out. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And we, I mean, it, it, the, the, it was one of the coolest to yeah, this day. Yeah, that was a fun experience. You're, you're on a stage that's a circle. So when one band finishes, they circle, the, the thing moves, and then you go wow. out. So... There was no band on the big stage where like Megadeth played and everything like that yeah. when we played. So everybody moved into the tent. Wow. And we so played we played a lot of people. A, it was a lot of people and it was just the coolest thing. Frank's throwing CDs like ninja stars. Yeah, just, I didn't know to go like that. I they're like exploding that. off people's <laughs> heads. Like you're just seeing them shatter. Uh, it was the cool it was just a great experience. We had Listen, that festival, like, we really thought, as the tourists, that we're like, wow, this, this is going to yeah, be... Yeah, we thought the, it was going to be like that every The night. whole festival, is gonna, the whole tour is going to be like this? So, we go, after we play, we get a we get a, uh, a trailer. 
So there's wine, there's food. Wow. So we're like, I was like, I can get not too bad, right? So then, like, and so I, I got to tell this. There's so that's why I said you left out this stuff. The, the everybody's walking around back there, and it's like the singer from Cradle of Filth is walking around a girl on a leash, <laughs> and we're like. Definitely seen some stuff. <laughs> and then, like, after a half an hour, the, the, I guess the stage back, they, they come and they're like, all right, you guys got to go. We're like, good, go. He threw us out of the trailer. We're like, why? They're like, Motorhead needs the trailer. Oh, we're my like, God. They're like, but there's, they're like, no, each member gets their own trailer because they can't stand each other. So, <laughs> we're like. And they only gave us, like, that. They're like, you got 10 minutes to get here, so drink or what you want. And I'm like taking, we're all like taking drinks for the road. And so, then. so. Like true Bronx people, we take everything that's not nailed down, <laughs> bottles of wine. I don't drink, but we're taking it anyway. <laughs> towels. Kids. Towels on tour. Have to have them. And now they have so, sanitizer and soap. Now, now I'm going to go to... So we are have the lanyards that say all access, and we're like, oh, we're going to go see some bands. Yeah. So so first of all, here, here kids, here, here's another eye-opener for... Big festivals like this. What do you think a t-shirt? We were selling t-shirts for $10 equivalent back then at shows. So at this festival, they ask for all your merch and they put it on their merch counter. So they were selling our t-shirts. The the Nick one I gave you right now, they were selling it for $30 in that back then. And we sold two shirts. Yeah, two. And I'm like, if you could, I, so we're on stage. We want to go see Sick of It All. Yeah. So, so this uh, great Yankee fan is on stage arguing with Armand because Armand, the drummer, is a Mets fan. So they are going back and forth. There's probably 10, 15,000 people waiting for Sick of It All to play. Not angry, like playful. Like, it was yeah, a playful sure, sure, sure. banter. Like ribbon, they're, yeah. they're, you know... And Lou is just like, can we start, please? Yeah, they're they're really awesome. That's right. It was like, a, just really a, cool to hang out. There, with. there was a. I'm gonna backtrack after I finish this because there's a real funny, sick of it all thing in here too. So they play this set, and we're like, oh, who's up next? We're like, this is great. We're on stage. Yeah. And like, Judas Priest. I'm they, like, they kicked oh, us my, all off the stage. We like, got out. Ki- Ripper. It wasn't. It wasn't Rob Halford. Ripper didn't want anyone on stage when they played. The guy comes out wearing a full leather jacket with mirrors all over it. <laughs> Looks like the biggest like coke fetish ever. And it was just like, we can't like, bro, really like. Oh, they weren't Judas Priest. It that it just <laughs> felt very like, oh, this is so. It was like, all right, so the hardcore band was was cool, letting everybody hang out, and now this band is coming on, and it's all get the hell out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. before that. I got a backtrack because when we landed for the festival, so Sick of It All had been to Europe, I'm guessing at this point, multiple times. Yeah. They know the, the drill. They bring their guitars, they carry them on, and then whatever bag of clothing they have. Us, being the morons and the rookies, we bring our heads. We bring our guitars. We were told to. We bring all of our merch. So... <laughs> These guys are, like, they're on the plane with us. Yeah. So they're, like, getting off the plane. They're gone. They're breaking out to the... So our t- their van picks them up because we were both playing the same festival. So they, our tour manager asked them, hey, where's Four in the Chamber? What's going on? They're like, oh, they're all the way back there. They have to get all it's their stuff. This was oh. pre-9-11, so you you could still take, like, stuff on the plane. Though. Oh, my God. Like, I was able to bring my aunt for free. And it was, like, all yeah. road cases. I'm like, wow, we really screwed this up. <laughs> But, but, but you learn. Live and learn, yeah, yeah, But it, yeah. Was a, it was a cool just, I mean, after that, it really became just a cool experience because the tour was poorly, poorly put together. Um, the first few shows were great. Like, the Austria show was fun, and then... Yeah, uh, we played with Shutdown. It was real. Actually, we played a lot of shows with Shutdown yeah, on we played that show. Few. Austria was good. Um, Berlin, when we played with Vision... That was good. Um, that and was 100 good. Demons, that was good. One show in... Uh, Belgium was in phenomenal. East, East Germany. Belgium was great. And then once we got to London, the first London show was decent, and then the whole tour fell mm. apart. We drove like two hours to Bradford, yeah. and there was like riots going on there. We didn't have, Helicopters a, we didn't have a tour manager because he dropped off. Oh, my God. And, uh, 
and like we're driving so now around. Your, your boys from the Bronx are alone in a. We're strange driving around country. the UK with no, with no like using maps because there was no GPS back then. And we get to Bradford where we're supposed to play the show, and the owner of the club's like, um, "I got a call about some interest to this date like six months ago, but no one ever followed up." We found out the rest of our tour was never booked. So so wait so I'm gonna put this in perspective for you. So we're in England now. It's cost us what was it four hundred dollars to cross the channel on the ferry so we're across the only show that we had was at the underworld the other six shows were never booked we're over there we're hemorrhaging money because we're now in hotels yeah, sure. so it's kind of like our own time our, drum, in, in our, our drummer and guitar player needed weed so they go out and they're you know they're like, oh, we got some good hemp or something. We're gonna smoke, and I'm like, did you look at it? They're like, no. It's a block like, of wood, wasn't it? They sold. We got sold a block of wood for like a hundred and twenty dollars. Oh my I'm god! I'm like, ha ha! <laughs> but it was just like, it, it was it was rough. Like Frank's trying to work feverishly to just to like get us back home. Yeah. At yeah, that yeah. point, like, what are we gonna do? Spend money? Like London's nice and all, but we were we were hemorrhaging. we were in our early twenties. Like there was no way. With the kind of jobs we had that we can afford to stay in London for a week. For real, for like, real. Uh, to get our so flight out I was out of like, there. let's get home. And we wound up leaving like two days early, which they got mad at me. I remember like, who are you? Go back and change We your... got to the airport 12 hours early for our flight home. Yeah. We slept in the we airport. We slept in the uh -huh. airport. You know, ever seen that scene in Anvil, the movie, where they're all falling? That was us. So, on, on a good side... Uh, I think you'd say the Belgium show was just uh, one of the most until, ridiculous experiences ever. The first night in London was great, and then after that, it was a mess. Mm -hmm. like, but it was it was a good experience, and we were like, all right, next time we know to make sure everything's booked. Because just like anything in life, it's a learning experience. Yeah. This is the first time you're doing it. That's right. Um, so all the lessons I learned from that tour, I used when I went back. No issues. It's amazing. We suffered. So Europe, kids, doesn't have air conditioning. Just to let you know that, for most places. Remember the Yeah, the they night? don't think of air conditioning like we do. Remember yeah. when uh, they slept in the bathtub? Yeah. Because there was... <laughs> slept in the bathtub. We even got to a point like where we were staying in so many places without a shower. I remember, Dave, remember we got we went half on that hotel room? I was like... Just, I was we weren't even the staying there. We just went in there to take a shower. Yeah. Like, uh, because, wow. well, listen, I was on the, the... When I did the merch tour with uh, No Redeeming, I did merch, me and Kevin Gill... Uh, we were going to stay at some place in Berlin, and it smelled like straight cat piss. So Kevin's like, he looks at me, and he goes, let's go half, hotel room, gone. <laughs> but again, man, it's all about the experiences and, and the cool things. And again, a lot of those people I met, I, I got to say, I got at least six friends that I still have to this day. The people were amazing. From the tour. Huh? From that tour. Yeah. like uh, Chris, the guy that signed us from uh, Kingfisher that plays in probably the biggest hardcore band in Europe, Rikers. I'm still friends with him to this day. We exchange, we check on each other and stuff like that. So, I mean, that was 2001. Yeah. It's just, I mean, got to see, uh, who was who was it? Dave Mustaine was in the food tent eating a meatball <laughs> or something and like when we were there. I remember uh, walking into, at the festival when uh, our tour manager was sitting at the table with Craig and Pete from Sick of It All. Now, I never met them before. I've been to yeah. all their shows. And, uh, he yells over me, Frank, Frank. I'm like, okay. I'm like, he's like, come on. I'm like, no, but you're sitting with sick of it all. Like, I, I'm like, <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't want to so be with I you. I sat down and I'm like, hi, I'm Frank. Like, introducing myself to Pete and Craig. And like, I'm scared to talk because these guys are like, to me, like hardcore legends. Yeah, and sure, they sure. are, like, sure. rightfully so. And like, they were so pleasant and so nice. Like, you know, I, I can't, I could never say enough to how nice they were at that show. You know, um, and they're still to this day they're the most humble and nice yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, I saw. I'm, I'm, at the festival we played last summer. Yeah, I was setting up my guitar, tuning it, and Lou walks behind me because he's a big pat on the shoulder. And I'm like, I'm like, hey, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> hey, man. I was like, all right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like that. And uh, it's like you were touched by uh, yeah, <laughs> your hero, like Batman just came by. Yeah, I was I like, I mean, they they have that song, "Get Bronx." I'd love to. Love to use that as an excuse to. to they would have probably no problem to do. No, they've always been cool with that. They're they're just good dudes on everything. Yeah. But then the tour fell fell apart, and then we got back, and then things for Four in the Chamber started to fall apart. Well, it it just you. As as a 
a young kid that gets a taste of tour life and like the it's just a lot and everybody's mind starts going in different directions like I mean this is what being a band is but it's being with a family you spend a lot of time with them yeah and like everyone is getting pulled in different directions of what they want to do and uh, the best thing I can honestly say is that sometimes when you let people that aren't in your circle into a band, they start ripping it apart with they don't understand your passion of why you do. They don't have the same passion. Do music. See, see, my passion came from that spark that from that Killing Time show yeah. and the Headbangers Bowl show, and I don't do it to get. I, I that's why I like to do it. I like that feeling. I like that adrenaline. Like Frank said, it's like a drug. Yeah. Other people want to get big and get on MTV. That's not what. It, that's not about it and that's you know our original singer John wound up getting uh, him I guess he got married with a girl we, we still can't find the guy to this day wow like he's I'm pretty sure he's alive uh, you know like no Facebook no can't find the guy John if well, you're out there she, well Look I mean up. that's what kind of led to start so after we got back from Europe we started writing a next record I'll follow up to existence but like yeah. somebody will pick it up for sure and I started writing my parts for it, and I saw the band going down the same the same uh, path that we were on existence. Like we got to hurry up and get this record out, and we got to get moving, and this and that. And then our old singer got into the relationship with I guess who is his wife now, and he priorities started to change. Yeah, like, sure, sure. Like he uh, he was happy for him. That was great. But then it started to him and I started to bang heads. And, yeah. Uh, and then one day I just finally had they enough. Bang and, heads a lot. and one day I finally just had enough and I quit. Yeah. And I see. he was like, fine, I, we don't want you anyway. And like, you know, so I quit and he, it's what he said to me. What do you want? We don't want you anyway. Uh, and, you know, then there's the whole. I, don't, I didn't know. It's about like, that. it's like Sorry. a, it's like a breakup. Like, so then he, they start, he starts bad mouth me. I start bad mouth him. Uh -huh. And uh, to anybody that listens. Um, and. Me for long, for two years middle. after that, I just I played in another band around here, and uh, and then th that was that was it. They kept they moved on past me yeah. until I returned in two thousand four. I'd like to say I was just trying to hold it together yeah. with like duct tape and masking tape at that point because again, you know, I'm the one that's handling like the MySpace and all this stuff, and there's. The, the band and the lyrics and the music make connections with people and people want that and I'm just like well you guys are not seeing the bigger picture here you're 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 infighting and again younger kids hard-headed nobody was talking them down my singer at the time was a very stubborn human being that thought he was right about everything and it just like again, the message gets lost. Yeah. Like, but dude, you said this, and you're. I, he couldn't balance the band in his relationship. He, so. he had no balance because he had a very demanding girlfriend that would like. So here's a funny story, kids. There was a thing called satellite phones before cell oh, phones. Oh Jesus! So while we were on tour in Europe, this is two thousand what one. Mm -hmm. This woman is calling the tour manager's satellite phone four to five times a day wanting to talk to because him. Because he hadn't, he hadn't, he hadn't checked it. in or emailed. Wow. And this is before cell phones or anything like that. It was global. So you had to go to an internet cafe to check emails or stuff like that or get prepaid phone cards. And you want to talk about embarrassment? Like, bro. So he actually had... She called the tour agency, which happened to be the largest tour agency in Europe, to get the to check on her boyfriend. And this is again, this is yeah, it was pretty. This is uh, like this is true story. A lot of and the more you, the more longer we go, everything starts coming back. Yeah, 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 so it's yeah, just yeah, like sure. again, music is passion. Music is adrenaline, and it just it started to go down not a good path where it was just like I can't hold this together 
without a core original member, it just doesn't, I, I don't have the energy. Yeah, sure. It's a lot of energy because you're not starting a band from scratch. You're starting an established band that people like, oh, I want you to play here and here. And I'm like, eh. like, and then Frank came back into the fold. We had a new singer at the time. Uh, it was basically the, it was me and Frank were the only original members. And the new singer and I hit it off really well. We're still friends to this day. Oh, wow, okay. Um, and uh, we just moved forward. And, you know, the we had the original drummer, the one that showed up to existence, not rehearsed or whatever. Yeah. And after like a year or so, maybe a few months, I said to Dave, I'm like, I know he's technically an original member, but he's got to go, Dave. Yeah, sure. I was like, he just can't handle the music we're writing now. And we had another drummer like waiting in the midst, the midst. Who's my I wanted to, current drummer now? Yeah, and oh, okay. so we got Tracy and, and uh, a friend of mine. I was playing like a band with before that, like nothing. This is so cool. Uh, really was looking for a band that was going to play with us, and we had a good core of members that really were on the same page, and that's when we we uh, wrote Memories Die. Oh, okay. And uh, though the recording wasn't really that that uh, good, because that was another one that could have. Sounded a lot better. Um, I, I felt that was we that was the time where we started to put out some of our better music. Um, not better, but uh, more evolved. Yeah, um, I, I still like again. Uh, teach his own on what they like. I always go back. I my favorite record that we put out will always be Unstable Foundation because, to me, I think it was just a perfect. The recording. Listen, recordings are recordings at yeah, this but point. But it's not that bad that record. Uh, well, listen, I'm just saying, like, the songs, the lyrics, I can always remember, like, the first time we played, we, we were out in Pennsylvania, we played Knockdown, and we got a big pile on for the kids singing along, and the song was about somebody battling, battling back and, you know, not letting it get them. Yeah. And I was like, you know, th this is this is why it's important. This is, the lyrics are touching people, and that's what the first... Like strength of convictions, the song. I mean, oh, the yeah. lyrics are very, like even my singer now, he like loves doing that song just for those lyrics. He's like, "Damn, John wrote some good lyrics." Yeah, and I'm like, bro, it's like those lyrics connect with people. When when you hear, "I know I can make a difference," that that's something that doesn't matter if you're like metalhead, punk rock, ska, or hardcore kid or anybody it's like you can make a difference it's, it's a positive like, vibe it's yeah, just sure, sure, these sure. are these are things that you know uh, i try to convey it to my singer now i'm like listen don't write just because like this is what everyone's writing. write what you feel and write to make that connection like that that record will always be by the way it's coming out on vinyl for this uh year so <laughs> Captain, do the plug I have to. Oh, oh, if you have to change your battery, yeah. I gotta run to the bathroom. I didn't send you the post that I saw the other day. So yeah, so unstable foundation, uh, the first four in the chamber EP will be released on vinyl as a B side with uh, the new four in the chamber record, uh, Empires Collapse, Amazing. this uh, year on Demons Run Amok Entertainment out of Belgium. So look for it. I'm actually pumped to get the vinyl myself because. Franklin? Oh, well, I would like to get the vinyl, but I would do nothing but sit on my wall because I don't have a record player. Well, this is 2023. It's called artwork. 2024. It's called artwork. <laughs> so, th thank you for the shameless are, plug. Are, are, are you all planning, I mean, this is jumping ahead, of course, to today, but are you all planning to do um, a lot of shows? We did. Around? Where were you, bro? No, no, no. I mean, when, <laughs> when the when the, the vinyl comes out with the, the B-side. There's nothing on the table at no, the no, moment no. because... I listen again, and and I think we did we did some shows in support of this last year, yeah, sure. and it was fun to play with Frank again. It really was fun. If we were gonna do, and he probably hasn't heard this because I just I, I really, really have the heart to tell me. <laughs> I, I I really would. It, it, if you're gonna do something for uh, um for that EP for the Unstable, uh, John has to sing. Yeah, it, it just at this point it's just. I'm yeah, getting. Uh, there's no way. Like he, we can't find him, and I'm sure his wife won't let him. Like, Steve will help us find him. We, it, we'll see if we can. We can it, it's just like him. honestly, I'm getting very. Maybe it's some because I turned fifty. I'm getting very nostalgic. Yeah. As far as, you know how things, need to be like if if you really again, but, 
So the other side of the problem is that, you know, I kept doing it. He did it. Yeah. So somebody's got to, again, this is where I don't think people realize when you make an impact of some nature, just the fact that you're doing this and we were invited to be part of it. Like, bro, you made an impact and yet you ghosted something completely. They, everybody asks me all the time, where is he? I haven't seen him. How is he? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I never understood that about that situation. Like, he, how, he was one of the main members of the band like that built everything up. Um, mo- most of the guitarists came, I wrote. He wrote every lyric. I'll never every ask lyric you all how all that for the process. first few every, albums, every lyric. lyric. Wow. For uh, for Except unstable bonus. foundation yeah. and existence, and we work. We were working well together, and like he put in all this work, and then just one day it wasn't important to him, and he just left. I, I just and, never knew how somebody could was, shut that off. So if that was maybe a, um, maybe it was his way of, of. It's substituting for for relationships in his life. Like once yeah. he found the girl he wanted to be with, then that wasn't so important anymore. Feels like we see cool. so many times yeah. in bands. Yeah, I mean, um, Frank's one hundred percent right. He he was the the builder and the architect of, like, dude, uh, setting up. Remember, this, this is before this is like before MySpace started. He was on the phone all the time, booking shows uh, on, on internet. Everything. Yeah, weekends would come. Like, I would get out of work at. 4.30, they would pick me up in Manhattan, yeah. and we would just go, and I wouldn't get home till like, like Monday morning at like 2, 3 in the morning. i get three hours sleep and do go to work you, do you the next hear, day. Do you, want, do you want to tell Steve the Detroit story? Windsor. Which one? Oh, I'd, I'd love to hear. The original I'd Windsor story. story. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out which part. All right, so I'll tell the story. So, uh, we met the band from New Jersey, New Jersey hardcore band, one for one. One for one. Great dudes. Uh, Dan, the singer, uh, he, it was like, it's so cool in the scene when somebody says something like this, like, uh, hey guys, uh, you know, I definitely want to hook you guys up. Uh, you guys want to play Canada with us? We're like, stop, come on. What are you talking about, bro? So he calls my singer like two days later. He's like, yeah, uh, next weekend, uh, you guys want to play Windsor Canada with us on a Saturday? We're like, how long is the drive? <laughs> Uh, what was it? Six, 12 hours. Yeah, 12 hours. Straight, too. Wow. It's 12 hours straight. So we're like, okay. So was it you or John that link, that rented the Lincoln? It was John. John rented a car because we, you know, we didn't want to put any mileage on our car. He rented some big... Lincoln Town Car. Lincoln freaking <laughs> Town Car. Because the head spit in the trunk with the guitars. <laughs> yep. And we just, we just sat back and like drove in comfort the whole way. Uh, I think we didn't go under 90 miles an hour for the jar. Gas was cheap back then. So yeah, yeah, holy yeah. God. So we get to... We get there Friday night, of course, late. Very late. And Frank's like, oh, I think I have something on my record. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have something. Oh, when we went through the border. Have you ever been arrested? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so right what? then, and, right she goes then, for and what? There. I go. Which time? <laughs> so, so as you can see, it went very awry. Uh, they, they had him for a half an hour, but, you but it know, wasn't anything. I got yeah. into some scraps when I was younger. Yeah, sure, was sure, it. sure. It was just like in a simple assault, but we we got through. <laughs> and, and again, this is part of the 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 cool about exploring and making experiences so we, we play the show and i forgot what it, it wasn't obviously a venue it had a stage set it up. was a bar it was like a bar but i was like we're in a different country we drove through detroit all this place and like there's kids that know the words to the songs and it was just like that's when we all fun. shared yeah. hotel rooms yeah, 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 and sure. my drummer did, always wanted to bring a girl back to the room <laughs> and he, and he, is this PG? No, no, whatever you want to show. Oh, okay. And he, they were, we're all trying to get sleep because, of course, we're normal humans and we like to sleep. Yeah, yeah. And he's doing whatever he's doing. Oh, and God. Frank, <laughs> she, a girl moaning. Is, is moaning his name. Oh, yeah, Anthony. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Anthony. And Frank yells, <laughs> oh, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I was hammered and sleeping, dude. <laughs> and it was, oh and then I think somebody threw a shoe at his head <laughs> because it was like, this is it. It was the four of us. Hey, there was he, no merch. He's in the bed right next to you. It wasn't in the bed. It was on the floor. Oh, on the floor. Yeah, that was yeah. 
blocking the bathroom. No one was doing it in the bed next to me. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't happening. We always we always had rules. Whoever drove get beds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoever yeah. did not drive gets floor. Yeah. So, I mean, there were multiple just like that's the adventure of going on your like the road with your friends. And because because you're young kids with no parents, no responsibility. You're staying out of your house because most of us still lived at home at the time. Yeah, sure. So like it was like awesome to just and be like. Like I said, I, I wasn't allowed to really go anywhere. My parents were like, you can't, you know. <laughs> nope. Like, they, they weren't super strict, but they weren't going to say, I hey, got a story, go a on. Frank's mom story. Here we go. Oh, my poor mom. <laughs> so, remember when Lemores did their supposed last show, and the lineup was like, Biohazard, Leeway. I, it was just a stacked lineup. And I was like, oh, look at this lineup. I was like, Frank, you want to go? Want to go, Frank? He's like, God, ask my mom. I was 16. <laughs> didn't go well. Frank did not she go She was like, well. you're not going to Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did what you sneak the... out, Frank? No. <laughs> what I, the I, group? You know, when I turned like 17, 18, she kind of, like a year later, she just kind of let it go. Yeah. Because the I, Italian I learned from, spoon of death. <laughs> I, I learned from my older sister that if you just stop listening, there's really nothing they can do to you. So yeah. like, I just started staying out later and later and she never said a word. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I should have just did it from the beginning. So who knew? Like, listening to your parents. I, whatever. I was like, I missed one of the greatest lineups ever. If my sons start doing that to me, then no. <laughs> they will. The cycle. We'll, the we'll cycle. keep going with the cycle. Uh, um, so do you all want to talk more about how the whole songwriting process went? Sure. Maybe how it's evolved over the years? And also maybe how your sound, or at least how you view your sound as evolving. I guess that's my clip. Yeah, Go ahead, yeah, pal. Yeah, here, so, I feel like getting the back camera in the, Back in the day, um, I had a little four-track recorder that recorded onto a cassette tape. And I would plug my guitar into it with the quarter-inch jack through a distortion pedal. And I would just play song, like just jam. And if I came across some decent riffs, I would bring it to their attention. Yeah. In the beginning, you have this idea in your head where... If you write a riff, this is the beat that you go to it. Yeah, sure. And this is what it should sound like. And it sounds amazing in your head. But when you're young, you don't realize that there's other people in the band. And they are going to put their own flavor on it. So everything may not come out exactly like you want it to. Which, in the, at the beginning, would drive me nuts. Yeah, but sure, sure. as you get older, you realize, like, the, this may sound cool, but it has to see if it works with everyone else. So I would throw a riff down. We would have a drummer throw down drums. And we would just feel it out to see how it would go. Yeah. As time progressed, I started writing riffs to whole songs and then coming in with drummers and saying, here's my riffs. What could you do to it? Yeah. And then that's how some of our better stuff would come out, which then the singer would, when uh, musically a song is done, whoever was doing vocals or writing the lyrics would go and write all the lyrics. Yeah. Nowadays, completely different world. In my head, that... Riff that sounds like it is with the drums is going to sound like that yeah. because they invented superior drummer. <laughs> so, so I can record, you know, the recording studio is becoming a, a dinosaur. It's becoming obsolete. You don't need you, it anymore. You can record riffs into like, uh, into recording software such as Pro Tools um, or Reaper or something like that. And then you can find beats through Superior Drummer with edits to match up to your songs and make it sound exactly like you want to. Yeah. If I do do another record with Four in the Chamber or anything going forward, that's exactly how I'm going to write the next record. Okay. Um, Jeez, you just really put me on the spot there. Huh? <laughs> you can just go ditto that. Like, well, just like he said it, you know? <laughs> just, just like he said it. That's the way it is. I, I don't know, man. I'm always big on... <sighs> when, when he originally like again i go back to unstable foundation i i, I liked it because it was raw it wasn't a lot of time i didn't try to do too much exactly nice. like yeah. frank when he was younger got very influenced by whatever band he loved at the time uh shy Halud, thank you so much for all your lovely hours of me fighting with frank <laughs> about riffs thank you because, like, you know, he'd see a band, he'd get hooked on it, and he'd be like, oh, I could do that. I could do yeah, that. Yeah, and I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like, I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> what are we doing? So, again, it was like a process, like he said. Like, majority of the time, it was carte blanche on him. Yeah. Like, whatever you want to do is up to you. I was like, but, but might I add, if I write a, 
if I do superior drummer with the drum beat <laughs> and I give it to the band, if our drummer is like, I don't want to do that, I want to do this, you listen I'm, I'm completely okay well, with he's, that. You're not 20 anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I want, so I want to give out my ideas and I want them to edit it, basically. Sure, so, sure. Absolutely, because it's a process where it's easier with, with a team to go forward as everybody bringing something to the table because, I, like, I find out now it's I'm very, like, I'm easy to please at this point. Yeah. Like my, like my singer is like, what do you think? I was like, bro, as long as you're making an impact with your lyrics, that's fine. Uh, John, when he wrote his lyrics, it's like, again, it was so long ago. I totally forgot. And it really didn't hit me until last summer when we did these, these shows for this record and we were doing some of the older stuff. And he comes to me, he goes, Dave, man, John really wrote some, good lyrics he did write really good lyrics. like really because john when again this is a reverse john didn't listen to hardcore or metal or punk john listened to rap and straight i was gonna ask you about it because you hear it he listened he to he did like some lyrics. Lyrics. Yeah. well he he evolved into liking that but yeah he, sure he sure. was so i want to go into a little full in the chamber history so John worked with me at Pathmark. Yeah. So John would come to see Without a Cause when we play like Wetlands and stuff. It's actually a cool video where Lenny jumps on him. It's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> but, you know, it's just like, wow, that's a foreshadow of what's coming. Yeah. But he was more, like only listened to rap growing up. He grew up in Co-op City, too, went to Truman High School. He listened to rap, and... um he started to evolve that into how he wrote songs. And it was really, it, but it's two different, like, uh, we came up at the same time as E-Town Concrete in yeah. New Jersey. Yeah. Played a lot of shows with them. And it was funny because, I always thought it was funny because Anthony, their singer, and John both were very hip-hop influenced, but the band sounded completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anthony was way cooler. <laughs> 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 Poor John at this point, but it, it's just always. I, I think that's that's hip hop always played a big part of the Bronx, at least singers' yeah. sounds. I mean, Fahrenheit. I was going to say Nine and Amando yeah. and, and Mike, their own flavors. Uh, John with their, it, it just always has a big part to it. And again, the Bronx, like one of my favorite all time movies, top three, Beach Street. Yep. All time. Who doesn't love Beach Street? Man? It, it's, Ray Mo. There's no, there's no breaking. It's all about Beach Street, first of all. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah freaking was West Coast. Fun, man. Exactly. You know, knowledge that. So, I, I think that it was something, and it's the hip hop culture was big back then, and this is, this is way before like the Limp Biscuit and Corn started, yep. in flu- like getting out there. So, just get your date straight out there, kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, a lot of these. Uh, the vibes were, were hip hop influenced. Uh, the first time I saw Armando at a mic, I think he was doing like a, a he did a guest spot for Without a Cause or something at a show, and I was like, his flow and his swagger. He always had a lot of energy too. Like, yeah, yeah it was just like a, it was like an explosion of personnel. Like, I just think such unique singers out of Bronx, like uh, Martin from Billy Club, is it. He's a, a character like on, on stage, and it's just so cool. Like to my daughters, it's Uncle Martin. Like, but it's just such a different when you know people as a person, and then you see them on stage. It's each one of these singers brought like Phil vibes completely different. Um, when you talk to Barry, Barry was originally the bass player from Go to Memphis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he evolved into their singer, and in Martin left. I think. No, this is way. Oh, no, way. they had a singer, Rob, oh, and he yeah. was. That's a, right. That's right. That's he right. was going to be better off at bass, and got, and Barry was going to be better off right. at singing. Nah, that's right. So they just switch roles, like. Uh, so Barry evolved. Barry actually did a guest spot on an Extinguish the Code song, so that was pretty cool too. But it was just like each of these singers did brought their own vibes, and I just still think like. But you have to remember too. A lot of people listen to everything. Yeah. That's right. Because yeah. in the, That's especially right. in the Bronx, like, you know, we used to sit on, on like my, my buddy's steps and like we, not every one of my friend, friends listened to metal. So they would have like, you know, back in the, in the eighties, blasting like NWA and sure. like, you know, uh, 
uh, and Public Enemy and all those those great classic uh, hip hop bands. What are you? You still black? Listen, man. I still listen to Public Enemy. That first thing on the Sick But All EP where it's yep, okay. KRS One. Oh my God, man! You you want to talk about Goosebumps? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But like, it's clobbering. But like, it's it's so hard not to listen. It, it, it's so easy, I should say. To incorporate that into music when you're hearing it all the time. It's all your. I, I, have, I have an older sister. Yep. I have an older sister and a younger brother. My older sister used to listen to freestyle, and my younger brother was all hip hop and rap and. No. Yes, he was. So like, even trying to write stuff in my room, it's not impossible for something to bleed into my ear yeah, and give right, me an idea right. without right. even realizing it. That's right. Yeah. 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 Definitely, that's a fair point. It and really it bleeds in all over. And to your point about the more, um, you know, commercial bands that you know were billed as as you know rap rock fusion kind rap of stuff. core. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the Bronx, it's something that happened that happened naturally. I mean, yeah, it wasn't absolutely, it wasn't thing. forced. Yeah, that's right. And you can hear when it's forced. Oh, and it sounds real bad. <laughs> oh, you can <laughs> definitely <laughs> hear when it when it's forced. And but it also comes back to like. I mean, the Bronx was was evolving its own sound. Then, I mean, we're, I'm just going back to the hip hop culture yeah, yeah, with sure, it. Sure. Then you had um, you had Biohazard in putting it in a little, and then in Jersey uh, you had Fury of Five uh -huh. dwelling in it. So it was just, but it was naturally like like Frank said, it was just the surroundings, and it was just. But everybody wanted to be Biohazard back in the early 90s. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, yeah. and then, you know, like you had other bands that were going down that same route, like Downset. Let's bring up Downset from California. Yeah. Um, very different California, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, they were. Um, Downset was like kind of like the same, the same genre style with the rap influence, but they weren't as heavy and as aggressive yeah, as, right, yeah. as Biohazard. So, like, it, it seemed to, that it was going in that direction. Yeah. Anyway, and... I think a lot of the Bronx bands were incorporating the, the hip hop from the, they were hearing everywhere, and they could answer that better than than I can. Yeah, and, sure. But that's how I feel it got into our music. Yeah. Like uh, John listened to hip hop, I was around it all the time, so yeah. it was. I heard it on my terrace in Co-op City all the time, so it was. Yeah. But it was never uh, like when John would bring in parts that it just was natural it wasn't right. like hey let's write a rap part yeah, yeah it yeah, wasn't yeah, yeah. He was, ha he's like all right just throw a beat down here and then he does something I'm like all right i'm gonna put a riff behind it yep. that was it Absolutely. it was just very it was not like hey we're gonna go in and do this yeah, yeah, it wasn't yeah. it was the writing process was very that's again when, when you're hungry and you're zoned in and you're dialed in to what you're doing it just flows yeah and also back then there was like hardcore rap and that fit right. hardcore music yes right. try incorporate like I hear rap songs oh, now God. that come out. It, I, you know, I, I don't want to bad mouth, but they're terrible. Like, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. it's kind of bad mouthing. But, um, but like, I could never see the style of hip hop and rap now going into a hardcore song. It's just not possible. Yeah, I know, it's, I know. Well, back then you also had the integrated bills. You had like uh, you had Onyx with Biohazard yeah. playing shows. BD it all. BDP. Yeah, I was gonna. And, and let's not forget the Judgment Night uh, soundtrack. Game that changer. Came out. Yeah. Movie wasn't very good, but the soundtrack was. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Booyah Tribe, where are you? J Jimmy Hazel from 24 Spies was, I was talking to him the other day, we, we'll, we'll record with him too, but he was saying that, I think he said, he doesn't remember the term hardcore rap being used before, he said the first time he ever saw it, was maybe in 1990, a Sick of It All, Karis One uh, show, and he said, I don't, you know, he was just speculating. I, I, it could be possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That um, was, you know, it was, that's probably probably right. Man. Yeah. It was just. It's when rap started to get a little harder. I um, think that I think it was a it was a, a merger that was bound to happen because of the edge. Yeah, they were both. Again, it's just you know they're you're fighting against injustice. You're talking about bad shit, bad yep. days, and you know got to get better. And yep. it's just a natural. And it was you know that's as we go deeper. It's kind of we never. No one ever said, "Hey, don't go in that direction. Don't yeah. do that." It was just like, like nowadays, it's everything is very like, oh, thought out. It was back then. It was all right, John. What do you got? Okay, done. Yep. All right, that was great. All right, because he really had a good thing of mixing up with, uh, and then he would have this gang vocals and pylons. Yeah, and, sure, sure. And then, love John to death. I mean, you know, remember the first time he got his dreadlocks and. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
But it, it is what it is, man. It was I mean, good times, man. I wouldn't change man. it for the world. Yeah. Um, no, it, was, it was fun, man. Um, so, what about, um, let's talk about uh, first times that you played in the Bronx. I mean, uh, obviously, before Four in the Chamber, Chippewa Club, Blackthorn, I guess. Do you all, do you all play Black, yes, Blackthorn? Yes, we did. In the Chamber? Are there other venues you played in the Bronx? And then we'll, we'll talk about, like, you know, kind of the most memorable Ooh. shows. So uh, first Lutheran Church, we played in th- in uh, Throgs. Yeah, oh, we, did y'all play that? Yeah, we, for the Bronx we, Underground. We did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Underground, we did. Going, um, okay. What was that bar right around the block? It changed its oh, name so many times. Uh, what? There's Alfie Alfie's place. Did y'all? Like, no, I never, never played Alfie's. Okay. There's Jimmy Ryan's. They, I know no, Jimmy Ryan's. Played. I never played. Um, well, there was a bar right down the block from the church. It was on Waterbury Avenue. Um, oh, okay, right down the block. It, it changed the, the name. Uh, they changed the name all the time. I used to live across the street. And I can't remember. The yeah, name. yeah. The, yeah, the yeah. thing um, with the church was, it was like, I didn't even. I remember when we got booked there. I was like, I'm not even promoting it because everyone's going to be, be there. And yeah. the problem is, <sighs> those kids. It was <laughs> funny. It was my old singer that went to the show. But it's like they never went anywhere other than that venue. So it, but it was still a lot of fun to play. Yeah. It, it was. My wife went to that. Did she? Went, went to went to those shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it gave yeah. them a good place to go and and just experience heavy music. It was pretty cool. I know they had another venue that was outside on the water. The Mannheim Club. And I remember seeing Billy uh, Club play that there. That was the Mannheim Beach, Beach Club. Yes. Oh, oh okay. okay. So I remember Billy those Club shows. Play there. It was awesome. It was um, good times, man. Yeah, it, it, those were definitely a lot of fun. Uh, Blackthorn shows were fun. Um, as far as any of them being were, memorable, not, not really. really. Um, did Did you all ever play? Billy Billy Club played this. I think it was just once out on Pelham Parkway. Um, there was a show they played next to the old horse stable. Yeah, yeah, we did play there. That's when Rich used to own that that. Little we played there. there. Yep, yep, we did. We played there with uh, providing the sick. Yes, we did. Night, uh, and, okay, okay, okay. And one time by ourselves, <laughs> we did. With uh, and we also played there with uh, you know a band from that Jersey band. Yeah, uh, what were they called? <laughs> I don't remember. They were S- silence. Something silence. Sounds of silence. <laughs> oh God. Uh, I-, I don't remember. We did play there though. Okay, okay. <laughs> we had our our room was right upstairs. Oh, our practice room practice was right room. upstairs okay, from okay. there. That's when uh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That was a. I forgot about that practice. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We had a practice room I mean, they, there. They had a funny story about that venue, which is why. I, but I don't really have any funny story about it. It, it, it could have been something great, and uh, I forgot. It just I'm trying to think of funny you, stories. You know, the that... problem with playing in the Bronx was was since there wasn't a lot of people, especially in the area of Pound Parkway. Yep, I know that's a hard. Yeah, you're it just is. not going to get people to go to yeah, shows. That's true. Like we would have to ask all our friends to come and, and sit through the show because they don't like they didn't like. It yeah, it's, so it's like music. it's uh, yeah, 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 you guys yeah. are sitting through the show to watch what. <laughs> but meanwhile, it's. It's just weird because, like, the area, I'm sure th- this is going to go for everybody, like, well, more for the other side of Pelham. So the area you're from, you're, like, you're playing in front of, like, 30 kids that you drive to, like, another show. Like, I, now that we brought up that practice space, I'm remembering a show we played at that exact time was when we played with Murphy's Law in Allentown. Oh. It was a Murphy's Law, Allen, uh, 25 to Life in the chamber and a bunch of other bands but we drove like all out of that show and it's it while we had the room above there it was like 400 kids there and it's like you just left your home and now yeah, it's like you appreciate it somewhere else yep. it's yep. just but it, it, it yeah and I and I really keep going back to what Frank said about Brooklyn had Lemores. yeah and we didn't just, have that we had and it's he's a hundred and the, even Pennsylvania like Back in the day, there was a club called CC's in Pennsylvania, and did, this was, I, I got to give that owner a ton of credit, because Vince, John would get on the phone, call him, we're four in the chamber, Bronx, New York, Bronx, New York, uh-huh. and this is Allentown, I mean, not Allentown, uh, Wilch- Musick, Musick, Musick. Yeah. how, like two and a half hours, right? Yeah, it's uh, a little longer, it's by Scranton. That's my I have a story to tell you after I finish this. Don't let me forget it. So you're going to enjoy it. Uh, oh, come on. To, to play. And the guy would give us, like, great shows. Wow. Like, uh, yeah, he was a good dude. We played with One King Down. We played with Earth Crisis multiple wow. times. He liked John. Like, I, I just, and it was like, bro, like, we're really, 
And I was, it was kind of like at that time, that's another thing. It's like those bands, the 90 bands, like One King Down and Earth Crisis were like huge bands. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was like, we're playing with this. And this guy was giving us what, like, I'm like, okay, whatever. They're letting us play volleyball. And I have friends, <laughs> I have friends to this day, uh, Carl from Strength for a Reason, one of the oldest bands of Pennsylvania, great band. And I'm still friends with that guy from those shows all those years ago and it's just it's again it's like culture shock for kids out of the bronx it's like oh so i want to tell your story now it's a good story <laughs> so we're playing music oh, Jesus. we're playing cc's and so again we're, we're young guys in our 20s mm -hmm. and okay it's either we here's the, here's the thing it's can we drive home or do we need a hotel room this guy don't worry guys i got this don't worry, I could drive home because nobody else was in any condition to drive home. Yeah, 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 yeah. So everybody just in the van just goes to sleep. Next week, I do. I wake up. We're pulled over on the side of the road. Oh, no. He's out cold. <laughs> I needed a power nap. Yeah, power nap. Makes sense. Hours <laughs> go by. But back to the whole distance thing. <laughs> so with, with he wants to deflect it. It's I okay. am deflecting. But wait, hold on. I'm going to finish this one. But meanwhile, we could play Clearfield, Pennsylvania, which is four hours away. The Yankees are in the World Series, <laughs> but yet he met. Oh no, no, no! Yeah, they were going to clinch the World Series that night. We play. He gets us from Clearfield, Pennsylvania, all the way back to the Bronx in time wow. to see the Yankees clinch. <laughs> not that I, not that I timed that. Not like he blasted every speed limit under the road. If we would have hit a deer coming home, we were. You never would be having this interview. <laughs> so to to press upon the fact that sorry, Steve had to. That, no, that's good. That the hardcore scene was in existence in the '90s it wasn't even existent. I had a bunch of friends that wanted to be rappers, like, yeah. and uh, they would play like a dance club and do one song in the middle of like the night where the DJ would run there. <laughs> their thing, and all of my other friends were like, "Yo, so and so, did you see him Saturday? He blew it up. There was like 30 people just popping their heads." And I would say, like, you know, I played, like, Pennsylvania last week to 300 people. <laughs> like, I just went to Europe. And it got to a point where I'm like, you know what? My own dad, I would slam down like a baby and be like, my own friends won't recognize what I've done when my other friend Where? sings one song flowers, that he had friend. to pay to be on the stage to do. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I know. It, it, was, was, it was really hard. Nobody. It, but you did it because you wanted to do it. Like, yeah. the hustle. Like, I, I, again, I remember, so you're going to know this. We did a Saturday we played a Saturday matinee on Long Island with District 9. And then we played Castle Heights that night with District oh, 9. Yeah. Oh so we drew, it was, bro, it That's was crazy. awesome. I could, I could never was, do two shows in the same day. It now. was one of the coolest things ever. We drove from one show. We're like, all right, let's go. Next show. And it was cool. It was like, because again, you're, you're 20s and. This is what it was. Now, not now you're not doing those two shows in one yeah. day. Your friends never recognized you. Would, would you all play at Castle Heights a lot? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we did. Yeah. We, were on, we were one of the house how, how, how crazy were those shows? Uh, they were good. It, it was, you, you know what, uh, Castle Heights became kind of clicky, you know, towards the end. Yeah. Um, and we we would play certain shows and, and – uh, we would get good response, but then other shows we wouldn't. It was like it was like a crapshoot. Oh, I see. I but see. like you know, I would go to shows when we weren't playing, and people would be going crazy. Like that place like was... watching Irate play at uh, yeah, Castle yeah, Heights yeah. was unreal. Like yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they, it just was like it was scary to see like what would happen during like, during their shows because it was a small venue to begin. It with. was a very small it was set up venue. Kind of weird too. Like yeah. the bar and everything, right? Yeah. It, it, it was. Uh, it kind of became like home base. For the Bronx, like honestly, because we played there a lot. I Ray played there. Uh, Billy Club played there. Yeah. Driven My Hatred played there. Go to Mentis. So it was kind of like a good home away from home. But everybody kind of branched out onto the Fahrenheit. We played. What did we play? Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit record, played there. Yeah. Record release. Yeah, that's right. We played their record release. Uh, it, it was District Nine played there. I, it was. It was play the show and then get White Castle on the way home. <laughs> Definitely. Did, but, did you all play um, any of the Mal Malali Park shows, or were those before, those before you started us. playing? Really, I missed out on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I went to a Malali. I was sick Park of it show. all. Played. Yeah, yes, we were at did. that show. That show was awesome. Oh my god! Fahrenheit played that show as well. Right? Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was one of the. I think the first one, their first show. One of the first shows. Yeah. 
as Fahrenheit because they played a couple shows with the new lineup as without a cause. That was yeah. 96 or 95 or 96. That was crazy to see them play that. That place. was the first time I ever saw Sick of Home. Wow. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Religious experience. I was listening to them for years, but yeah, sure, sure. I, I was the, the it was the first time I ever saw them. I was like, wow. I saw them first time at Obsessions in New Jersey with Sepultura, Sacred Reich, and Napalm Death. Wow. And they opened the show, and I just, to Frank's point, you don't see... Now, again, them now, when you go to the shows, is not like it was, like... Bro, when hardcore, there's just people all over the place. It was crazy. Like, they connect with the crowd. Yeah. That's big, man. It's connections with the crowd. I just, and Castle Heights, honestly, it's so funny. Now, it's like when I when I talk to friends that are like in Europe and Japan, especially. Yeah. Europe and Japan. Hey, did you ever play Castle Heights? You know, yeah, it's like the, legendary. where all yeah, the yeah, wild yeah, yeah. dancing started. Yeah. I'm like. Yeah, it did play. It just kind of, and you look back on it, it's like a lot of that dancing evolved from Castle Heights. A lot of the, the windmills and spin kicks, it all came from a lot of that stuff because some of those shows, I look at the videos now and I'm like, I have no video of any Four in the Chamber show there and I'm so upset. Oh, wow. Because I do remember some really crazy yeah. I remember that night we played with District 9 there. It was, it was, was really show. crazy. But I, then we would play a show and no one would move at all. It was wow. It was just, it was the bands that were on the bill, I think. Like, if if you had people from other bands that were there to see other bands watching you, they may not be into it as much as someone else that is with a different band. band. Yeah, sure. So, like, you know, you, you would play with all these different bands. But it was also weird. Like some shows would draw, and some shows wouldn't. Like I remember one King Down playing there, and there was nobody there. Nobody. Like in I'm the like 90s. It's one King Down. Like um, I remember our trip face played there. It was nobody. Wow. And these were like, but it's so funny because then you look at like, but uh, we I like playing with bands like that because yeah. I, I liked playing with a very diverse crowd on. Just to get more. And then we played with One King Down. I think it was like someplace in Utica. No, it was uh, Cortland. Cortland and up upstate. Yeah, train, sure. That train place where we ate all their food. Oh, you ate their food. I was hungry. Yeah. Frank ate all the vegetarian and vegans food. <laughs> There's multiple it looked, stories it tasty, where yeah. Frank like, decided to. <laughs> they didn't say I couldn't touch it. No you ate their me. peanut butter because I remember that we threw it. <laughs> Sorry, I would have went and bought them Frank peanut butter. I mean, yeah. <laughs> those things happen. Don't give me a room and say eat what you want, and I'm gonna get mad when I eat when I eat. That's a I fair want. point. You can't give give guys from the Bronx like us. So I gotta promise I I gotta tell the Go to Mentis story on this one. So we did a lot of shows with Go to Mentis. Uh, so we did this one show. We were supposed to play Massachusetts. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. So we all. I, I don't know who was late. I'm Barry says it was not Ramon. I'm pretty sure it was. It was probably Ramon. So we go to the show, we drive four and a half hours, the show's over. Oh my god. Because remember, this is before cell phones yeah. or anything like that. And then we wound up playing football. football. We beat Godamentis in football. <laughs> and, and Barry will admit to we beat Godamentis in football because he said we were athletes. I, I don't know where he gets that from. But whatever. So Four and a half hours to drive to Massachusetts to play a football game. Now that's family. Come on, guys, that's yeah. family. Like we were, I, I, I'm not gonna lie. At the time, I was pretty mad at them because we waited and everything yeah, was true. late. But like after the football game, I'm like, that hey, shit happens. Yeah. Like, and Barry's the kind of person you can never be mad at anyway. Yeah. You know, I wasn't mad. I was mad that we're playing football. Yeah. We drove four and a half hours. Well, to what play was I gonna do? Wait till we get back to the Bronx to beat them? Like. A, <laughs> It was just it was just like one of those I, I, we had to show our male dominance on the football field. Like <laughs> All right, so now now you're gonna tell this story because this is a great story. Oh god. Uh so MapQuest. Remember kids? Yeah, I remember MapQuest. All right, yeah. so MapQuest. Original MapQuest. Singer John, we were playing a place called Romans in Massachusetts somewhere. Uh I think so our singer Gets the directions to Bill Roman's house. That was me that did Bill oh. Roman's house. Go ahead. <laughs> Tell the story, so Frank. I type in Romans in whatever town it was in Massachusetts. And 
like I, I guess I was busy. I just printed out the directions. Yeah, the first sure, thing sure, that came sure. up is it Romans. So we're driving. All of a sudden, we pull up to someone's driveway. I'm like, I don't well, well hold on. This is driving <laughs> after it was Bill hours. Roman's house. <laughs> hours of driving. Mm-hmm. So then we finally have to get. We we got to get to the show. Luckily, we're only 15 minutes away. But there was two bands left. It was us and one other band. Like it was 11 o'clock at night. So it's there's snow and there's ice on the ground and it was basically. Unload the van right onto stage, play, and then put the you van back and get out of there. It wasn't even setting up merch. It we was were just... only like 15 minutes away. So, so did you knock on Bill Roman's door? No. He no. was close to doing it. Cause we I've never been pain. called an idiot more in my life. At least not to my face. We were also um, abducted by aliens one night, too. <laughs> oh, we were, yeah? we were, we, I don't know how it happened. We ha- This only answer I have is something because we were driving. We were coming from Virginia Beach, and we were driving north. And just we were blinked and we were going south. Yeah, we were going, wow. and it was it wasn't south like a little. It was like oh, south wow. an hour already. And That's there was weird. three minutes missed. Yeah, and it was just like what just and it was weird because it was like me and, and, and I was John. Like, I was like it was like eleven forty when we noticed we were going south. I'm like wait. It was like two minutes ago when it was like eleven twenty eight. Yeah, what just happened? I was like, a, it was very. It was I, I don't. For, for the record, I don't think I was abducted by aliens. I just think we were <laughs> drinking the whole day. Except I, I was not drinking, attention. so I don't know how it happened. I still want to know uh, another good uh, tour story. Okay, so on the road in some backwater hillbilly town in Pennsylvania, I think was it Pennsylvania? Wow, you just said so many wrong things in that. But. Oh, whatever, we get pulled over. The cop was probably 18. He sees the New York plates. He's coming with his gun drawn, oh sliding God. across the back of the truck. Who was doing merch? Because they, we had him covered in a blanket. Steve, that was in upstate New York. Oh, that it was, was upstate, upstate. Okay. Oh, upstate New York. Okay. So he, the merch guy is now covered with a blanket. I think Frank was doing 110 miles an hour. I didn't get a ticket for that one. I did for wow. the other times. And, uh, yeah, like I was like, wow. Like at any point, it's going to be a bad story because the the cop the, the van is loaded. Of course, my drummer and my guitar player have loads of marijuana, and this is back before legal. So it, it just it could have went really. And that was I think that was Cortland because you almost hit a herd of deer too. Oh, it was wow. it got very foggy. I had the cage anyway, so and it got. <laughs> It got later, and it was like all of a sudden, Frank's like, <laughs> and it was like fifteen deer in the middle of the road. So, so Megatron, which is our van, yeah, it was like it, all it was was pass a driver, passenger, and a bucket. That was it, and all room for equipment. So we had a second row in there. No, we didn't. If you think you're not thinking of Megatron, then. no, I. Don't. So Frank used to drive around because Megatron had this massive cage on the front of it. Like, I don't know who the previous owner or what they were doing. It was like a rhino bar on a police car. Yeah. yeah, yeah, And he used to drive around shopping cart, hit shopping carts in supermarket (laughs) parking lot. It it was just one of those great, you know. I did a lot of stupid things. (laughs) (laughs) It was good times, man. That van was great. It was a war horse. What what, what happened to the van? Where where is it now? We sold it when when John left, right? We actually got full price for that van. We sold it. Wow. And we beat the snot out of that van. Like, really. Yeah, we beat on it. We barely... Like, I, 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 yeah, I, you we, abused that. You never totaled it. it or anything. John sold it, got the money back when yes. he left, right? Yeah. Because you guys still had it when I quit. Yes. What, what's the furthest place away that you played in the in the U.S. that you drove to with the van? Ooh. Virginia. Virginia. Had to be Virginia. Virginia, Virginia or North Virginia. Carolina. North Otherwise, Carolina. we really no. It was Virginia. Virginia. Virginia Beach. Yeah. We did with the we van. South. We I never don't... we never made it down to Florida, so. We kind of we did Puerto Rico a bunch when, of times when uh, oh, okay, okay. we put out our first CD, uh, the Unstable Foundation CD. Um, we were playing shows more like tri-state area. Yeah, sure. And then when Existence came out, we started venturing out long. But after the Europe tour and I quit and stuff like that, we never really had a chance to really, really branch out. I see. Like I we see. were gonna plan. Like after Existence came out. We were going to go to Florida. Was on the table. We were going to go to Japan. Wow. We were going to start touring the U.S. Like we had jobs too, which was sure. kind of hard. Like in yeah. rent to pay. Like but. real jobs. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, it just kind of all disappeared. Then you know, Dave 
I, I left for what, two years? And came back in Thanks, buddy. 2004 Appreciate and Appreciate you know, we made leaving. some changes, got it back together. But after memories die, we kind of, we kept going through drummers and we kept going through singers. Pro, we went through two singers and then we finally decided in 20, uh, 2009 to call it quits. Yeah. And like, we were like, all right, everybody's going to go their own way. You know, our singer, who's still one of my good friends and our guitar player at the time, started another band uh, called Slam One Down. Dave, uh, we found a singer and our old drummer, Frank, and myself, we started a band called Unstable Foundation. Oh, and, so it was uh, like the evolution of Four in the Chamber. Sure. And recorded our first CD, which to everything we've ever done is actually my favorite CD. Oh, really? Uh, okay, yeah, I was ask it you is. That. It's okay. my favorite CD. He That's loves it. CD. Because what, he came in a room and said, do what you want. Oh, and, okay. and, I did. Yeah. It, was the, it was the easiest thing ever. I was like, yeah. do whatever you want. But by, by the time that band, like, it got to the point where... We couldn't get any traction. Our drummer quit. We got another drummer who was the worst possible person we could have gotten in the band. And, I told uh, you it was. And uh, Nobody listens to me. Dave quit, and then we just kind of limped along, and then we called it quits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was getting to a point. I, was, I had a girlfriend at the time for like two years, and things were getting serious, and I was like, you know what? I have to get a serious... I, I, like, I had a good job, but I had to get a better job. Yeah. Not one where I showed up half asleep all the time. Like, yeah, sure, and, sure. And then, uh, yeah, so we moved on, and you know he played in bands after that, and I, I kept started the drug a family. In my and, system. <laughs> well, that's the problem. He called me last year, and said he emailed me, Dave, and said, "Do you want to play two shows this summer?" I was like, "Well, I haven't Shameless played. Plug. I, I haven't played in a while, sure." So. I had I hadn't picked up a guitar in like three years. Wow! So I had to basically relearn everything. Like when I started playing, we the tones rough. just didn't sound right because yeah, sure. it's been so long. And I got back to where I was before I stopped playing. And we did all these shows, and now it's like a drug. I did the two shows, and I was like, "All right, you're done. Now what?" Well, now you go back to your family life with your kids and your job, which I, I wouldn't trade for the world. I yeah, love sure, my family, sure. but it's like, but. I still want to do a show and write another record. I mean, I, I have it in me. I have at least one more record left. So that's wow. where where we are right now. Yeah, 